So the presentation we're going to give today is uh, a slight derivative off of one that the Small Business Development Center, Betty Hogue and uh, Linda Tuberty, uh, were sponsoring. Uh, came from a federal grant from the Small Business Administration. They gave funds out to state governments and said, we'd like for you to go out and educate small businesses on the risks of cybersecurity, data risks, data breaches. Uh, the government understands, federal government understands they can't do it all. They can't reach down to the grassroots level. So, you know, in an indirect way, that money, that funding, the, the, the dedication to put this together has trickled all the way down to be in this room with you folks today and also the presentations we did this summer for several small uh, groups at the downtown library and the north side library. I'm not going to go on too much. Of, I mean, uh, Phil was very nice and said, feel free to talk about your business and promote yourselves and all that. PJ Networks, as he said, has been in business for 12 years. Uh, it started as me, a one-man show, coming back from Santa Barbara, wanting to kind of cookie-cutter template what I was doing with the company I worked there called CompuVision uh, and bring it back here and start my own business. And it took a number of years, as any of you have worked in a, a very tiny business, it takes a few years to get momentum. And a dozen years later, we're up to a dozen employees with Keith Sorelli being the most recent addition. Uh, we do everything and anything small business related. And small business, keep in mind, is typically 100 users or less. I think you guys understand that. Uh, there are a lot of small, small businesses that think that small business is 10 or fewer employees. That's a small business. <laughs> but, you know, all the way up to 100. And by Microsoft standards, it's either 500 or 1,000 employees. So. You know, definitely uh, uh, Hansman and Weeble falls in the small business category. Uh, and we pretty much do everything. It's, those of you that have grabbed a portfolio will see there's a long, long list of everything that we do. But if it's a small business and it's technology related, we do it. Uh, and we specialize in things like wireless communications and security. And, and if you want to read about more, you can go to our website. There's plenty of information there. But because of the amount of material we have to go through today, I'm really just going to jump right into the presentation. We're going to move through it at a fairly good clip because there's a lot of content here. I recently added information this morning based on things going on this week. Uh, one of them was a data breach that I believe I am a victim of, and I'm pretty sure that every one of you in the room, and you've probably heard about it, it'll be coming up in one of the earliest slides. But not only did I get that privilege, but I was the victim of another form of data breach that was probably preventable, but not, you'll, when we get to the example, and I'll call out what it is, um, you'll see why it was easy to kind of be taken advantage of, but I won't let it happen again. Um, and it wasn't anything to do with computer security at all. It was just me not taking the time to look at my surroundings and understand, you know, that there are risks everywhere you go. So without further ado, we're jumping into the presentation, Small Business, Big Threat. I always give credits to um, the SBA, George Mason University, their Enterprise Center helped put together their, the original slideshow, uh, and then First Citizens Bank. PJ Networks and Small Business Development Center teamed our resources together to bring this to the, to the local community. So there are game changers going on in the world today when it comes to cybersecurity. First of all, we're always connected to the internet. It seems like no matter where you go, no matter what you do, some way, shape, or form, you've got connectivity, and connectivity is a surface area of vulnerability. So you've got more windows of opportunity for people to get to your data um, and to, to be compromised. Number two, we have an IT-centric business and society. So there's been a huge increase in business targets in the last 10 years, and the hackers are surely taking advantage of that. So there's, a, there's, there's more windows of opportunity on an individual basis. There are more targets in general, each one of those presenting more surface area. And then there's a new class system by tech skills, meaning more and more people that may not have a background at all in technology are moving into technology-related fields because that's where the job market's going, but they don't have any depth in it, so they're not knowing some of the most basic fundamental things like password complexity. And that's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's just it's, it's a fact. So we have, to, we have to do something to address that. Um, the statistics of 2015 statistic increase in cyber attacks uh, in the last four years have gone up by 660%. I believe the most recent statistic I saw has shown that that continues on that same trend. There are some of these statistics that things are going exponential. In other cases, they're going in like kind of a linear path. This is one where it seems to be steadily growing at about that percentage. But keep in mind, those are build it's building upon the previous years. So there is a little bit of an exponential component, but it's not quadrupling every year. It's, it's just becoming a greater risk. 
That doesn't mean financially. That just means the, the, the number of attacks, not the financial impact. So what do data breaches cost per year? This is 2015, estimated $100 billion in the U.S., $300 billion globally. And believe it or not, after the first time that I read this presentation and actually presented it, I started thinking to myself that those numbers seemed awfully low to me. I mean, don't ask me why. Maybe I'm jaded, but they seemed awfully low. So I went after the first presentation, I did some research, and I found from Forbes' website um, that from 2013, from 2013 to 2015, the costs of uh, cybercom costs, cybercrime costs quadrupled, say that three times fast, uh, and it looks like there's going to be another quadrupling from 2015 to 2019. So that's the costs involved. Um, they're predicting that the cost of data breaches will reach 2.1 trillion globally by the year uh, 2019. Uh, large banks, retailers, federal agencies make the headlines when they are hacked, but all businesses are at risk. According to Microsoft, 20% of small to mid-sized businesses have been cybercrime targets. But as I said at the last presentation, and there were like 20 people there, I said that basically means one in five of you has been a target, but hopefully, or will be a target, um, but hopefully if you take to heart what you're going to learn here today, you, you'll never be a victim. You'll be a target, but you won't be a victim because you won't get breached. Um, and I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, there will definitely be some question and answer time at the end. So I'm just going to kind of plow through the materials. If it's really, really urgent, raise your hand. Otherwise, when we get to the end, before we dive into the questionnaire, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. In fact, I'm not leaving today until everybody's last question is answered. <laughs> so um, according to the, this, this was from yesterday. The New York Times reported, Equifax says cyber attack may have affected 143 million customers. Um, so how many people here have a credit score? <laughs> Chances are your data has been breached because Equifax had your data and they were breached. 143 million people, um, and they're one of the they're one of the bigger ones. Um, about half the country. Though. About half the country, yes. And and we're talking. And if you think narrow down to just adults, pretty much everybody's been compromised. The attack on the company represents one of the largest risks to personally sensitive information in recent years. The third major cybersecurity threat for the for that agency since 2015. Makes you wonder how they can still be in business or how they'll be penalized or will they be penalized. If this was a smaller organization that got breached like that, if it was one of your clients and they were breached and they didn't have adequate protections, they couldn't prove that they did everything in their power to protect their data, the federal government would make them buy per identity theft insurance for the next three years for every single client of theirs or customer of theirs that had data get breached. You, you can imagine how expensive that would be. But I doubt Equifax will probably be held accountable for anything. I'm sorry if I sound a little bit um, pessimistic, but it just seems like these large entities, th th how do you even fathom the amount of money that it would take for them to provide that kind of protection for everybody? They, they would put them out of business, which is probably what should happen at this point. Um, this is about as it gets, said Pamela Dixon um, at World Privacy Forum. If you have a credit report, chances are you may be in this breach. The chances are much better than 50%. So that's one of the instances where I was breached this week, um, the company said the exposed data included names, birth dates, social security numbers, addresses, and some driver's license numbers, all of which Equifax aims to protect for its customers. On a scale from 1 to 10 in terms of risk to consumers, this is a 10, um, said Aviva Litan, a fraud analyst at Gartner. Um, that social security number, big time, big time. Somebody has that information and your birth date and your address, they can go out and get loans in your name. That, it's, it's that simple. So everybody, all of us, are going to have to be really watching our bank accounts and, and hopefully have some sort of a reporting set up so that you know when somebody's filing to get a loan in your name. Jump tracks just a little bit because, like I said, there's a lot of topics and I'm going to roll through them. They don't all segue smoothly with each other. So we're going to talk briefly about social engineering. It's a conversation that Keith and I actually have enjoyed discussing a few times because he's been engaged to do some social engineering penetration tests. Um, social engineering in the broad definition is the use of manipulation of using psychology to coerce someone into giving up information. Um, some examples would be a phishing email, um, fake emails, chats, websites designed to impersonate real systems. We all get those. They're almost always just regular old spam that basically say, hey, you need to 
click on this button to reset your password. You need to go to this website and verify your identity. It's spam. It's somebody just fishing around trying to get a little bit of information, enough to leverage you. And maybe one piece of information isn't enough, but if they manage to get another piece through another method, then they've got the two pieces they need to put together to be able to compromise your identity. Um, the more dangerous form of phishing is spear phishing, or is, the kids are now calling it whaling. So, you know, W-H-A-L-I-N-G for like the big fish. But technically, spear phishing covers that. And that's where somebody like a corporate leader, um, the head of a company, the president of a company, um, will have an email come to them from somebody within their org, looks like from somebody in their organization. Or what I've personally seen twice in the last year was somebody within the organization getting an email supposedly from the president of the company saying, and these are companies that deal in large financial transactions, government contracts, saying, hey, we need to transfer $10,000 to this account with this ranking routing number in order to close this contract. And they actually knew the name of the contract. They knew the name of the owner of the company. It was finely tuned. And the client had already, the client had literally already started the process of getting the funds to transfer when they decided to forward to me the original email that came in and said, would you look at this? We, just at the last minute, we realized that you'll answer this question for free, which I was willing to. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, look at the, if you looked at the properties of the email behind the scenes that you can't see on the front of the screen, if you looked at the properties of the email, you could see where the sent from address and the reply to address were not the same. So it said it came from the president of the company, but the, the actual sent address was not. And they, they killed the transaction, but they were that close to pulling the trigger and sending $10,000 down the line. And they're a large enough company that after that transaction had happened, it might have been six months before anybody even realized that they'd done something stupid. And those are the type of things that you want your clients to be watching out for. Phishing emails. We'll have an example of one towards the end of the presentation. <coughs> then there's impersonation or tailgating. It's the physical imper uh, impersonation of a trusted uh, person or somebody piggybacking uh, onto allowed access. So that would be an example of um, if, let's say, if we were doing your IT tech support, we're your third party outside support, um, somebody comes walking through the door one day. You know me, maybe you know Keith. Uh, somebody else who you don't, you've never seen before, Joe, comes walking through the door wearing a PJ Network shirt with the same embroidery on it and says, hey, PJ sent me down to check out your server for you. You're having some issues. Don't let that person through. If, you've, if I haven't walked him through the door and Keith, if nobody you know from my company hasn't introduced you to them, then you would pick up the phone and say, hey, I need to speak to PJ. PJ, did you send somebody named Joe down here? And I would say, actually, no, you should be calling the authorities right now and please stall him while they arrive because it would be somebody impersonating PJ Networks. Same thing could be true of somebody wearing an, an air conditioning repair hat or a plumber's outfit. Um, so that would be impersonation, and it works. A lot of times it will gain somebody access to a building long enough to find an available network jack in some empty office, and they can put one of these little Raspberry Pi devices. It's a $50 microcomputer that can be plugged into a network jack and basically just sniff information and send it out to somebody else on the Internet. So they would just be in the building long enough to do that. They'd walk out the door five minutes later. Oh, the air conditioning checked out fine. They're down the road. Meanwhile, you've got a bug sitting on your network, basically siphoning data and sending it out to somebody else. So that would be a case of impersonation. Tailgating would be somebody walking through the door in my wake. So I come through the door. You guys have an emergency. Um, somebody happens to know that. However, I don't know how they would know that, but somebody knows. Or maybe they're just sitting around the corner waiting for what looks like an opportunity. They see me walking in. They drop in step behind me, and I'm not even. I'm not looking around me. I'm walking through the door because I'm in a hurry. And when I come through the door and they see it's me and I wave, the guy behind me walks through the door and waves too. And as soon as we get to the next hallway, he splits to the left. I go to the right, and he's in the building, and I didn't even know he followed me. So that would be an, a, a case of tailgating. It's also the case of where if you've ever walked up to somebody's apartment building and you had to do the buzzer thing to get in the front door and as you were leaving, somebody, as you were walking up, somebody just happened to be leaving. And so you're like, and they're usually like, hey, can I hold the door for you? And you're like, thanks. And you walk in the building. But haven't you ever wondered, it's like, well, what if I was a, what if I was a rapist or murderer, a thief? Somebody just let me in the building. It totally bypassed. So that's how people get around security. It's because we think we're being courteous when maybe we're not, we're not doing something we ought to. And then there's baiting, and that's eh, it's an ambiguous word, but the promise of an incentive for gathering information, i.e. gift cards, free movies, money. I've given this presentation a number of times now, and I'm not quite sure how that one fits in. You know, hey, give me your social security number and you can have a candy bar. I don't think I'm going to fall for that, 
But I mean, there are cases where people are like, enter something, some piece of information, even if it seems innocuous, and you'll get a $50 coupon to something. Stop and think about the information you're giving. You know, anything, any of that list that we read off a minute ago about your social security number, your address, your phone number, your birth date, those are things you really want to keep private. So, best practices to protect yourself at a bare minimum. Number one, back up your data. That's not going to get you back stolen data, but it will get you back damaged or encrypted data from ransomware. And I can't tell you how many companies we have recovered back to 100% working capacity either because a critical system died or in a couple of cases because clients got, were victims of ransomware, which was actually in, in a couple of cases how we got them as clients um, because they realized after they'd been hit and all of their data was encrypted uh, that they didn't have any protection in place. So we put protection in place. Um, but backups are so critical and daily would be at the bare minimum. And in many cases, a lot of the modern backup solutions like the one that we storage craft, Shadow Protect, um, does hourly snapshots. And so you can recover the data of a company. If they get hit with ransomware at 1230, then you can just basically restore all the data back to how it was at noon, and you only lose a half an hour's worth of, of work, um, as opposed to going back to the previous night's backup. And if the ransomware hit at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you've lost a whole day's worth of work for 80 people. That's a lot of man hours. So backing up your data, having it off-site, small, small, small companies that don't have or want a cloud backup, and you've probably all worked with clients of yours who don't want a cloud backup. They're, no, not in the cloud. The cloud's not secure, and there's certain good arguments for that. Um, then at least they should have something that's being swapped off-site. You know, even the tiniest businesses we work with have an external backup drive that once a week on Monday they'll take it off-site so that if the building burns down, but they're getting nightly backups. They're just taking it off-site once a week because trying to ask a client to take it off-site every day is a little, you know, they, it just doesn't work. So, but at least weekly, you know, if a small, small company loses a week's worth of data, it's not the end of the world. Um, but backups are critical. And I'm, my, my engineers call me like the backup, you know, dictator. Um, properly configured network, use an IT pro. I did not put that in there. That was part of the presentation when I got it. Uh, they're just saying that you can't expect, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, your nephew or your cousin or your, your, your nephew's son or somebody could come in and cobble together a basic business network, you know, get three computers talking to each other and sharing a printer. But those days were back when cybersecurity wasn't really that much of an issue. Nowadays, I can almost guarantee you that if a non-professional puts together a business network, no matter how small, and walks away, it, it could be walked through like tissue paper. It, there's no real hardcore security going on there. Um, one of the most common things that we see now with really small businesses is home routers. You know, the type you walk into Best Buy and you pay 40 bucks and you buy a Netgear or a Linksys or a TP-Link wireless router and it says firewall on it, but you, you know, you're putting that in front of a business that could be the target of hackers and that, that's, it's no protection at all. Now, for the home user, it's adequate, but not, not, not for a business. And we'll, we'll cover a bit of that at the end of the presentation as well. If I'm going too slow, I can. No, I'm just, just kidding. Um, so, uh, antivirus software, keep it updated. It's not just antivirus that's going to protect you, though. A good antivirus by itself without up to date uh, Windows files and third party software like Microsoft Office and Java being up to date and Adobe Flash Player, just having a good antivirus is not going to protect you. I, I can guarantee you that. We've seen, we see it all the time where people are like, well, how did I get infected? Well, your Java was three years old and it was a Java injection, so it took over your system. After that, they learn, keep all your software updated. And the good antiviruses nowadays do help you keep your software up to date. They'll tell you, for example, Viper Internet Protection will pop up and say, hey, you've got three programs out of date. Would you like to update them? You say yes, it's done. But most of the free ones won't do that. You have to pay a few dollars a year to get a paid for version. And then finally, your credentials, um, passwords. Uh, the longer they are, the better. Don't make it easy. Make them long, make them complex. We'll talk more about password complexity in a minute and how you can come up with some nice complex passwords. Um, so good credentials probably, you know, this probably goes a lot farther than that as far as protecting you and your identity and your data. And then the biggie that I just mentioned a second ago, um, Windows patches and third-party software need to be updated too. Those are a much bigger vulnerability than an outdated antivirus software. So um, once again, Windows can be configured to do the Windows updates automatically. 
there's plenty of antivirus solutions and other softwares that can be configured to do your third-party patches. Or if you have a client, if you have a company that's using managed services, and I don't know if Hansman and Weeble's using it in-house or if you have a third-party company, but they would take, for example, PJ Networks for almost all of our clients have a support contract where we're monitoring all of the client systems all the time for any suspicious activity, firewalls turning themselves off mysteriously, antivirus going out of date, outdated software, outdated windows, all kinds of wonderful things so the client doesn't even have to think about it. If you don't have somebody, if your clients don't have somebody doing that for them, they need to be doing it for themselves. So it's, it's very important that those don't get overlooked. So really understanding malware, um, the definition of malware is basically designed to I don't agree 100%, to let a hacker control, get control over a computer device. Not really. The definition of malware is code where that is written with bad intentions. Mal, malware. Very simple. Spyware, um, uh, pop-up ads, it, it, web browser, all, anything, any software that's on your computer that is not there at your intention that could do anything you don't want it to do would be considered to be malware. Even something called a PUP, which stands for Potentially Unwanted Programs. You go and download something you want, like an online calendar, and while you're doing it, it, it automatically downloads and installs McAfee-free online security. Almost everybody here at home probably has, unless you've gone and manually removed it, somewhere over the years, you've gotten a free version of it. Do yourselves a favor, when you go home, go to Add Remove Programs and get rid of it. McAfee or McAfee, whatever you want to call it, it it's the worst. And one day, I'm going to get a letter from McAfee telling me they're going to sue me because I run around telling everybody that, but McAfee blows. There, you can quote me on that. Um, we've had to uninstall it from so many computers, not because it left it vulnerable, but because it made it crash. So stick to the name, just stick to the good stuff. Um, McAfee, McAfee is not. Viper Internet Security, Bitdefender is good. Norton is pretty good, but it bogs a computer down. Um, there's plenty of good software out there, and I, I, you guys can email me, and I'll give you recommendations if you have clients that want to, to pick from like a handful of selections. Um, malware may, might not act like a virus. Um, so, for example, one of the symptoms of getting crypto wall or ransom, any kind of ran ransomware, specifically crypto wall, would be the user would call me up and say, I was browsing the internet, I went to a website, I clicked on the wrong link, the screen locked, the computer stuttered for a few seconds and the mouse kind of did this little skippy thing, and then the computer just rebooted on its own. But it, the good news is it came back up, but it's running really, really slow. And I say, unplug that computer right now and let me get down there because those are the symptoms. Most ransomwares, for whatever reason, follow that scenario where they hit it, they kind of cause the machine to freeze up and lock up. Because it's injecting code into the operating system, it's forcing it, it oftentimes causes the computer to reboot. It's like kind of a defense mechanism, but when it comes back up, the ransomware is fully active and it is going to work encrypting files both locally and on the network. So those are like the classic signs of, of just like there are signs of a stroke, th those are the classic signs of ransomware that I've seen. Um, malware is usually installed by a virus or connecting to a network that is infected like, by Wi-Fi connection. Email, 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 email. At least three quarters 50% 50, 50 to three quarters of the infections that we see people get came in through email. So a really good spam filtering solution almost always knocks down the chances of getting those type of infections like dramatically, like at least by 75%. So a really good spam filtering solution. Uh, and then the worst malware can send information about your computer or device anytime it's connected. So you might go to a public Wi-Fi spot, <coughs> connect to what you think is a free public access that's actually a hacker's mimicking a public Wi-Fi like a Panera Bread, they get into your system and, and install a piece of, of malware. <coughs> you don't do anything critical like banking or anything. It's like you don't even, you're just reading the news. You go home. When you go home and open up your banking online connection, the software's still there and it's sending that information back. And key loggers are when you're typing in your username and password, even if it's blanked out on the screen, a key logging software is recording your keystrokes and sending it back. So somebody would know within three minutes of you logging into, for example, Wells Fargo, what your Wells Fargo username and password is. All right, so, really understanding malware, the usual suspect. This is not my slide, but I kept it in because it, it's some data in there. Um, called ransomware, aliases, CryptoLocker, CryptoWall, Locky, Key Ranger, Tesla Crypt, 
uh, the modus operandi, locks and encrypts files, then deletes them until payment is made. Um, I don't think technically most of them delete them. It just encrypts them to a, with, to a level that can't be unencrypted. So for all intents and purposes, they're gone. And trust, there is, unless somebody after the fact stumbles across the algorithm that was used to encrypt the files, and some, that's happened a few times where there was some really massive ransomware and then the federal government got their hands on it and was able to get somebody to come up with a decryption code and then people could actually get their data back after the fact when they thought it was lost. But in, mo but in 95 or more percent of the cases, once it gets encrypted, your only course of, of action to get it back is either restore it from backup and if you have a backup copy of it, you're good. I mean, you're, you can get everything back. And the data typically normally is not sent anywhere. It just gets encrypted. Um, the other option is to pay the ransom. And it's a, it's a tempting thing. If you have a computer and you've got all of your wedding pictures and your, your parents' photos and your, everything you have and your vacation videos, and all of that gets corrupted and gets encrypted, and the ransomware is $300, even if you think it's just a, like, even, even if you think there's practically no chance it's gonna work, you're tempted to pay that because those pictures and, and that stuff is priceless. And I actually have seen people pay the ransom and I've actually helped people get their data back. Um, I, I encourage them not to pay the ransom, but it, in one particular case, there really was no other recourse, so he paid the $300 in Bitcoin. We got a decryption key, we applied it to his computer, and all of his data came back. The problem is there's no way to tell if that infection left anything behind so that a month later it didn't happen I mean everything was a happy ending but the bottom line is if you had a good backup you wouldn't have to worry about paying the ransom because you would just recover it from backup um, how, why wouldn't they be able to get in and put the ransomware on once you install your backup well, they still can, but the backup is just going to get you to recover. So if you use a, so that's, a, but it brings up a good point. So if you're using a backup solution where you're plugging in an external drive and then you're copying your My Documents, which all the videos and all that, onto that external folder, because that hard drive is plugged into your computer, if your hard drive gets hit with ransomware, then so does your backup drive because it's just another drive letter. However, if you're using a backup program, like Windows has a really good built-in backup program that compresses and takes all of your data and puts it into like a .bak file, if that's the case, then ransomware can't get to it. The file's too big to encrypt. So it, I mean, you know, so it's basically makes, or if you unplugged it, if you did your backup once a week of your home computer and then unplugged that hard drive, you're safe. Doesn't matter what happens to your laptop or if it gets infected, you can recover from it. But leaving that plugged in and thinking copying and pasting, no because whatever hits your C drive is gonna hit your E drive or your F drive. And that's why it hits networks. So when, you hit a, when, when a ransomware gets onto a network, if it gets on a local computer and you're using map to drive letters to access shared data, it'll start going through every one of those map drive letters on the network and encrypt all of the company's data. And we've seen it hit well over 100,000 files at one client site. And it took about a day and a half to recover everything because some of the data had been corrupted, but certain file types hadn't. And it was an accounting firm so, for example, we wanted to, their QuickBooks files were fine, but the, we wanted to recover all their Word and Excel. There was 100,000 files. So it took a little bit of scripting to get it all back. But at the end of it all, it was all back. And then we told the client something that they hadn't thought of. We said, okay, here's our bill. Um, give it to your insurance company. And she said, really? I said, yeah. And she gave it to her insurance company, and they paid it all except for like a $250 deductible. So... Yeah, so the first thing we think of is let make sure your clients know if you do have something like that, whether it's a lightning strike or whether it's ransomware, chances are whatever is cost to get the data back is going to be a, an insurance claim. Uh, WannaCry, that's a recent one. When I did the first presentation two months ago, it was very recent. In fact, it had just happened. Now it's a couple of months in the past. Um, WannaCry happened uh, because there was a vulnerability in Microsoft's SMB, server message block which is one of the protocols on Windows operating system. And Microsoft didn't know about it until, until I think the beginning of March. So they released a patch for it in mid-March, but the supposedly, uh, nobody can, the National Security Agency knew about it for a long time. My, the, the National Security Agency has this big bin of known vulnerabilities of things that even the, the manufacturers like Microsoft don't know about. So that if they ever want to get into a hacker or a terrorist computer, they've got a back door that even the manufacturer doesn't know about. You know what the problem is with that? WannaCry took advantage of that vulnerability and whacked 200 million computers world, worldwide. So, you know, who, I mean, then they ultimately they're, make, they're, they're, playing, they're kind of playing roulette with the rest of us, assuming that, well, we might have a more important need for this data than 
the risk is, but I mean, in this case, it took, took down hospitals in the UK. It took down computers all over the world. Lots of people lost data. And it all happened because many people did not update their systems in time. So the release came on March 14th. Um, because we do managed services for our clients, we had it pushed out. We don't push out updates like that the day they come out from Microsoft because a lot of times Microsoft releases bad patches. If anybody's been using a Microsoft Windows computer for years, you'll know that every couple years you'll get an update from Microsoft and it just boogers your computer. It just, and then sometimes you know, they'll release a fix for that and it makes it all better and sometimes it just, it's so bad you have to take it in to get repaired. But we've learned that we don't want to roll out a, micro, a bad Microsoft update to 700 client computers. So we typically wait anywhere from three to seven days after a big release of patches, and we'll just read the news and see if, and we also have a handful of clients that aren't under managed services that get automatic updates from Windows. So if after three to five, let's usually three to five days, we don't hear anything about a bad Windows patch, we'll release it. But that's, you know, it's a lot easier to, to hold off for a couple of days than to push out a patch too early. But in this case, there were two whole months before the, the WannaCry virus came out. And there were hundreds of millions of computers that weren't getting updates. So, uh, and it also means don't just trust if you look at your computer under Windows updates and your, it says your computer is up to date. Don't believe that. Click on the check for updates buttons because about half the time you do that, you'll, it'll come back and see new updates that it didn't see before you click that button. So manually check for updates about once a month. Um, so prevalent threats targeting the financial industry. Um, there's crypto ransomware, which is continuous attempts of, a, you know, a company keeps getting these infected attachments that keep coming in and because the employees are educated. And I have plenty of clients um, that aren't under our, we've got a certain spam protection we provide called Spam Titan that so far has been 100% successful. We have not, you know, knock on wood, we have not had one case of a ransomware infected file come into a client site. But for the other ones, you know, they'll forward them to me on it. And the nice thing is because we're under Spam Titan, They'll forward it to me, and, and Spam Titan will strip out the infection on its way to me, and I'll get an empty attachment. And the question will be, hey, Phil, would you look at this and tell me if this looks like it's like a scam or an infection? And I'll say, yeah, it's, it absolutely is. Sometimes it'll come through, and if it's a link to an infected website, the spam filters can't always catch that because there's no malicious code in an email that has a link to the Internet. So those are the ones that normally get through. So the main thing you want to make sure your clients know is they should not have employees that are click happy. If they get an email and they, it's not important or they don't know who it came from and it's got a link in it, don't click the link because the link could take you to a dangerous territory. But once again, clients forward things like that to us all the time. We don't charge for that if they're a regular client. And it just takes me maybe 90 seconds to look at the email, to look at the properties, to hover the link, and then reply, no, it's a good thing you didn't click this. And many times it's like the IRS wants some information from you. That's a really big one. Um, UPS tried to deliver a package to you, but you weren't there. Please click here to, to uh, schedule the next delivery attempt. Um, all kinds of, I mean, there's a different one for every day of the week. But yeah, those, those come in a lot. Um, uh, DDoS ransom threats. DDoS is a denial of service attack where somebody from the outside on the internet will point at your firewall, on your external firewall, and hammer it with packet with information requests like they're trying to connect into your network. And, but, but in many cases what they'll use, it'll be like a malformed or an incomplete request. So every time one of these requests, and they can send millions of them, the server on the inside or the firewall, depending on what's talking to the outside, will see that there's a request, but it hasn't been finished, so it'll wait for the rest of the requests. But then meanwhile, a million more of those requests come in, and it's trying to shake hands with, and what it'll do is it'll lock up the network. It'll lock up the internet connection, and that's called a denial of service. And there's so many different ways they can do this now. It used to be, it used to be kind of a very specialized art, but nowadays you can, there's a denial of service, rent, you can rent this. It's a rent a service on the internet for hackers who can pay like $9.95 a month and have access to a denial of service attack that they can then threaten businesses with and say, if you don't pay us $300 within the next three days, we're going to launch a bunch of denial of service. And it's all an automated system. The people launching this don't write a line of code. They're renting the services. It's, it's insane. Um, then they're, uh, and, and sometimes, but the real ones will often hit a larger company. Let's say they might, if, let's say they wanted to target you folks. What they might do is two or three days in advance of, of, of issuing a ransom email saying you need to pay us, they'll take you down for 20 minutes here and there. 
So they'll hit you at 11.30 on Tuesday, and they'll hit you at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, and then they'll hit you at 8 a.m. on Thursday. And then on Friday, one of the partners, one of the, the, uh, the, the partners would get an email saying, did you notice your internet, your internet went down for 20 minutes on this day and this and this at these same times? If you don't pay us $500 ransom today, then we're going to basically bring your network down until you pay it. And we've shown you that we can do it. And then depending on how big the business is and how important their internet is, they can either pay it or not. But like anything else, how do you know that if you pay it, they're not going to go ahead and hit you again for the ransom? But that would be, that would be a denial of service ransom threat. Um, fake Facebook pages targeting the financial industry and its customers. Um, and not just the Facebook pages, but the ads along the right-hand side. Those are deadly. And I'll have an example of one later on that is almost a guaranteed infection waiting to happen. Um, and th they kind of annoy me because you see them and you're so clicked to, tempted to click on them. And then there's remote access hardware show below. I was talking about you can get a little device so somebody could walk through the door. And so let's say you've got a, a computer in one of your offices. So the office is empty. They sneak in. They tailgate somebody. They see me walk through the door. They tailgate through. They sneak into the first open office that nobody's in. They basically unplug the network cable from the back of the computer and plug it here, and then plug a network cable from here to the wall or to the back of the computer. So it's in between the two. And now all the data flowing through that device from that computer is now getting recorded and sent back out. So that would be a remote access hardware. Um, remote access Trojans, um, which are your standard Trojans where they get on your computer and then they start sending information back out. That's your traditional a Trojan. It's, uh, uh, a virus that sits on your computer and typically will send information back um, of all different kinds. Some of them are relatively innocent. They're sending, sending back information about your shopping habits and all that, but you know, that five years ago that was the thing. Nowadays you don't have to do that because now Google and everybody else tracks everything you search. I mean, I think we've all, it's, really, it's, it's annoying and amazing at the same time that you can go out and, and let's say Google search for golf clubs because you want to buy your dad a set of golf clubs and not three minutes later, you go to some other website that has nothing to do with, and, and golf club ads are popping up. I mean, it's, it's annoying. Uh, but that's, but you now Trojan can be doing something fairly innocuous like that, or it can be more aggressively trying to capture actual data from your computer. Uh, and then there's phishing, spear phishing, and whaling to get a foothold in the bank. So, to enable particip uh, participating members of the financial services sector to mature their cyber resilience capabilities, the government recommends for cyber resilience, anticipate that there's going to be some sort of a vulnerability or an attack, withstand that attack, recover from it, whatever damages it does, and then evolve beyond it. So, I mean, it's fairly generic, but I mean, it's pretty much recognizing your risks, making sure while you're patching them up, you, you don't take any damage from them, and then if you do take any damage or discover after the fact that you've taken some damage or some data loss, recover from that and then learn from that and, and patch up your vulnerabilities. So acceptable use policies, uh, policies. A lot of people think that acceptable use policies are for larger businesses. I would certainly ex uh, expect that Hansman and Weevil has an acceptable use policy for their computers here. And, and a lot of companies roll it right into the employee handbook or manual that a new employee will sign off on. <clears throat> I personally think it's a little better if it's its own separate document so that you can get somebody's attention and they can read through it because it should say something very clearly like, when you're in this building using one of our computers, anything and everything you do is ours. We have the right to look at it, monitor it, doesn't matter if it's personal email, business email, if it's playing solitaire, whatever you're doing here, that's our internet, that's our computer, that's our time. Yeah, and some companies will say, fine, during lunch break, if you have an hour break, then you can, you know, and you can even set web filters up so that between 12 and 1, they allow people access to certain sites like Facebook that are normally blocked during regular business hours. But some way, shape, or form, the importance of setting an acceptable use policy is so that if an employee breaks those rules and uses a computer in the company for malicious activity, you can do something legally about it. <coughs> because if you don't have an acceptable use policy, and an employee uses one of your business computers to, to gain access to one of your client's financial information and steals that information and makes off with it and uses it in bad ways, <coughs> even though they've committed a crime, they didn't break any of your company rules. They broke a crime. They, they created a crime, 
But if your acceptable use policy for your company didn't say that they're explicitly forbidden from using your company computers for any kind of illicit or illegal activity, then you don't have any legal recourse against them. You can fire them, but you can't have them arrested. You can't have them thrown in jail. You can't sue them. You know, you can let them go because you. Now, once again, the authorities will arrest them for the crime, but nothing legally has been done against you because you didn't have them agree that they wouldn't do it. Get them to sign something saying that they understand the rules. Then you've got them legally. <coughs> and that would be an example of a, of a, a base. Well, that would be a more detailed one. You can tell by the way it starts. It's a multi-pager. There's a simpler one um, that I can. I think Ed Schmitz has already gotten a copy um, from one from the cybersecurity presentation you came to. So you know, there's a one pager that's great for small clients that covers all the basics, and I've got copies of that too. I'll be glad to share them with you guys. I probably have them on my thumb drive, um, and it's just a one pager that just in like several sentences says what you can't do. They get their employees to sign it. They're legally covered. If you're a five employee coffee shop, yes, you still need to do that because one of those five employees could be stealing data. So, Myth. So, so how yes. I mean, when I think of like these breaches and, and, and you know the two point one or trillion dollars loss, I'm always thinking of external threats. Mm -hmm. But I mean, internal threats is that? Seventy-five percent, approximately, of the threats are or or or, or the are from the inside, whether that's intentional, malicious, or usually it's from carelessness. So, for example, every single case that I've seen of ransomware in the last few years was an employee inside the organization who got an email that clearly was was not a legitimate email, in my opinion. You know, like pleasing to look at my resume, and then a resume dot zip. And it's like love, Julie, or whatever, with nobody labeled on it. And the employee, this is a true example, and the employee who was an intern double clicked on it. And the owner of the company was livid. In fact, that intern didn't stay there much longer, didn't, didn't have a job much longer. But the, but the owner of the company was, what, you're an intern. Why did you try to open up a resume? You have nothing to do with hiring here. So yeah, I mean, we see it all the time. But most of the vulnerability is between the keyboard and the seat. So that, that's where the weakness is. Yeah, very, very, you know, I can't think of a single example of a client. We certainly haven't had a client get, get hacked from the outside in. But, I mean, to be fair to our competitors, I haven't heard of any local firm getting hacked from the outside in in the last 12 years that I've been here. But I know none of ours have. Most of your small businesses are not going to take a hack because it takes too much time, too much effort to build the hack and to break in. The companies that are going to get hacked are the ones that have, like, um, um, the... Credit, Equifax. See, like Equifax, like Target, like uh, any of the large organizations. Those hacks take weeks, months to actually do, but once they get done, then I get 143 million people and however much information I can take out of there. The statistics are more probably around 85 to 90 percent of the vulnerabilities for any organization come from inside. Yeah. Um, engineers, technical people will lay in balances and checks and controls to prevent spam from getting in, to prevent viruses from getting in as attachments. But the, the long and short of it is, is it, it really boils down to what the user does. And that's how and why these viruses propagate, Trojans propagate, malware propagates, ransomware propagates. It's likely because a user that was unaware and untrained in these types of uh, protocols, if you will. I mean, Perusing the internet and perusing the web, uh, perusing email is no longer like a stroll in a suburban neighborhood. It's now likened to taking a stroll in an inner city at two o'clock in the morning. You've got to be on your toes, you've got to have your head on a swivel, paying attention to things that you wouldn't normally pay attention to, or when you least expect it, something's going to come through, you didn't look at it, you didn't pay attention, and wham, somebody's, somebody's got, and a lot of the viruses, a lot of the malware, a lot of the Trojans, They'll live on your computer quietly. They won't give you any sense that they're there. They won't, re they won't, take, um, they won't take control of resources. They're just going to be quietly capturing information and sending it back to some command and control. And the only way you're going to actually know that uh, is if a virus scan picks it up or you happen to put a sniffer on the wire and see that all of a sudden you're sending packets from your computer or from your network to some country in Europe or South America. So nine, yeah. Yeah, at and least I'll in the 90th percentile. Um, is where the vulnerabilities lie as far as the internal user and the lack of training in internal users or the lack of savviness and understanding how to prevent just some of the basic stuff that has a massive snowball effect is kind of why we're here now. Yeah, and look, for example, looking at a higher end firewall, not a home model, but a business class one will show things, for example, gee, we see a lot of data packets that are going to the Ukraine. 
you know, that's a pretty clear indication somebody, and then that firewall, if you turn around and look at the logs properly, you'll see where that, what IP address on the network that's coming from, and then bingo, but then you would want to analyze the machine to see what data was being sent, but it's all, but it would start by seeing what's going out as well as what's coming in. It's not, it's not an inbound hack. A lot of times the, the, the hack has already happened and now it's an outbound, outbound vulnerability. Yeah, so we employ, uh, we subscribe to know before. So we have a program where we're trying to keep ourselves educated as to what, you know, um, you know what, what, what things you can do and what to look out for in emails and this sort of thing. So right. I mean, that's, that's at least hopefully hopefully uh, giving, us a, giving us a little more protection or creating an awareness within the firm. It is, and I've played around with a couple of their freebies, you know, they've, uh, um, you know the, the email test to see if who's going to click on the, on the link that's obviously not supposed to be, you know, clicked on and all that. Um, but I, I did want to talk to one of your IT guys at some point about the experiences you've had, because I'm thinking about signing up for that as well. We've got a, a, a score of resources, but it, no before, so I have to be very selective. We can't, we can't subscribe to every single one, but no before so far, it looks like it's, it's, a real, it's a real gem, especially if you know selectively which tools you want. So yeah, that's, that's good that you guys are being that proactive. And there was a label, I mean, um, we all did this program, I mean, what was it, 45 minutes? Or, <coughs> uh, you know, that was kind of educational. You had to, you had to answer certain questions uh, appropriately to move to the next section so that you got some confidence. And every employee took that individually? And everyone did. Okay, did everybody make it through? Uh, to, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so, simple myth or fact, users of Apple and Mac platform were impervious to cyber attacks. Okay. Okay. I'm just looking because there's still a couple of Mac users out there that still want to believe that so desperately. Um, no, it's not true. We get, and, and 10 years ago, it was pretty true. Um, I've been in IT for 22 years. Apple's have been, and actually my first computer was an Apple IIe, so. No system is unhackable. Right. It's just the systems that we hear are most hackable are the ones that they write the most code for, and Windows was the one. Now Apple's becoming much more of an up-and-comer with all its mobile devices and iPads and all that other stuff, so now they're writing code for Apple now, yeah. and they're just as vulnerable, so you've got to run antivirus and be diligent. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and we do get infected Macs come into our shop, but not all the time, but they're coming in more and more regularly. Um, so Mac users have to be more aware and that excuse for using a Mac in the office environment when a PC would have been better fit was like, my Mac won't get infected is no longer a valid argument. Um, finally, we get the best password practices. Uh, the length of the password, the longer the better because a brute force attack, just random combinations of numbers and characters based on an algorithm. Um, once you get past the eighth character, eight characters or longer, you've reached a complexity level that, that is almost, is exponentially better than seven. Like at seven, there's an algorithm they can use to hack, and I don't, Keith knows more about the specifics of it, but when you get to the eighth character. It's but, several orders of magnitude right. of security that you increase because of the way the hashing al algorithms work. I can crack just about any seven character password um, relatively quickly with my laptop. But the minute you take that into eight, char eight characters using upper, lower, special, things of that nature, all of a sudden I need a room this size full of servers to crack that password in anything that resembles a short period of time. Right. Yep. Um, so now, according to then, once again, this slideshow was, was given to me to work with. Um, they were saying a minimum of 16 characters. Uh, and then they're saying 25. I mean, where does it end? One good way to come up with a nice long um, password would be to use a complete, and, and, and actually the NIST, the Natural, National, National Institute of Security Standards and Technology, um, recently has released information indicating that the old combination of numbers and letters and upper and lower up to a certain number of character length is actually not necessarily any better than coming up with a really, really long passphrase. Because in, in the old days, you wouldn't use any kind of a dictionary word in a password but if you're using a long, long phrase, like, you know, I go to the Outer Banks every summer and I really enjoy it, two exclamation points. Well, that's a nice long sentence and it's got like, you know, 40 some characters in it. And so just by the very nature of its length, it's gonna become complex enough to not be hacked. The problem is people like to use passwords over and over and over again. So coming up with a unique password for each one of your sites is when you wanna have some sort of a, a password wallet or password keeper 
which we're going to talk about in just, just a second. Real quick, um, the best way to come up with passwords, short of using a password um, generator, something that's going to generate a password for you, is to take a phrase. Like, if you love your job, you take the phrase, I love coming to work, and you make the I maybe an exclamation point, a zero, or an, an O, a zero, an S, a dollar sign, and you can kind of use your own little cryptography and make your password virtually impossible for any um, brute force attack, dictionary attack, or anything. And if you have a phrase that you you uh, use with your sweetheart, nobody's going to know that. So there are ways to come up with some basic small phrases that you remember that are that are familiar to you, and then just use your own logic. A zero, I mean an O is a zero, a one is an exclamation point, or an E could be a three. And this is going to make your passwords a heck of a lot stronger, a, a lot harder to crack, and it's going to make it no longer low-hanging fruit. It's going to make it so that if um, somebody does get your password, that they're they're likely not going to be able to do anything with it. They can right. I can compromise a server and pull the SAM database, and which is what all the ser or where all the passwords are. But if all the passwords are eight plus characters long, and they use phrases, they use all the upper and lower. All of a sudden, I've got a group of a bunch of passwords that I literally need a room this size full of servers to be able to crack. So it, it matters. Although if they did get your password, they could potentially know what to call your sweetheart. So that could be a problem. <laughs> but no, that's an excellent, excellent we point. We have filters against certain phrases in that system. <laughs> um, so there's the length of the password. There's the complexity. Um, uniqueness, one and done. Um, I've been dragging my feet on that one so long. I, I have about a handful. I have like five, six different kind of standard passwords that I use for different levels of complexity. And you know, for banking, it's like a super long, super secure one. And it's only used for like two, diff like two different banking accounts. And then it's down a level to stuff that has to deal with financial, like maybe Amazon or stuff online. And that's, you know, and then all the way down to the basic ones that I use for stuff that has signing up for newsletters and things like that, where you have to have a subscription. And then it's more of a generic one that I use all over the place, because if somebody figures that one out, all they can do is get a bunch of crappy email newsletters. Um, but one and done is the way it should be done. It's really the way it should be done. So that's what we're preaching today. It means use it on one website. Don't use it anywhere else. Uh, for safekeeping, use some sort of a password manager, wallet, or safe. Um, some of the more popular ones are. Um, and also sharing them only if you have to, and then using a, be smart about it. Don't email anybody any password ever, um, because email is one of the most easiest, one of the easiest, mostly, one of the easiest things to compromise. So, for example, if my wife needed to know the password um, because I changed it maybe on our bank account, and she's worried, um, then she could call me up and I'd give it to her over the phone. Or if it was going to be one of these funky ones, I would text it to her. But I wouldn't just email it to her. Look, I'll eat it. It's like, no, don't do that. Um, and then, and employees should never share their passwords amongst each other. I'm not going to say there's never an exception. There, there are quite often two people that will serve the same role or share the same computer, like a reception computer. And in that case, I think the best thing to do is to have an account called reception. And then those two people can know the password to that. But if it's, an if it's an account that links to one individual in the company, they should not ch share that password with anybody. Um, so passwords should be encrypted <coughs> where you store them. Um, can, uh, a password, this is all about a password wallet manager. Um, a, most of them can create strong passwords for you, but that's literally a jumble of random numbers and letters. Um, there, you, can, you can access them from your phone and computer. For example, I, I use KeePass. Um, so I've got a copy of that here. Um, even though I'm not, I'm not a huge Google Docs fan, I've got a copy of the encrypted database that I keep the passwords in, in Google Docs. So I can access it from this phone, from either work computer, from my home computer. But in any case, I have to have a very long password to get in to my password manager database. Um, uh, it'll analyze password strength, and it'll tell you whether the one you're using is, is secure. Uh, and then they can help with two-factor authentication. In fact, I read uh, just today that LastPass, there's a new feature in Last. maybe it's not new, maybe I'm old school, um, that, can, that will allow you to achieve two-factor authentication. Uh, there's another program called Duo um, that one gentleman at the last presentation talked a lot about, and I've looked at it, and it looks really good. And there's a free version that I've installed on my phone. Um, but Dashlane, which I think is more of old school, LastPass is definitely probably one of the most popular. And I really like KeePass. It's free. It's open source. 
It's super encrypted. It's not stored in the cloud. I mean, if you store your database like I am in Google Docs, technically it's in the cloud, but I'm the only person in the world who knows, the, or my wife, who know the password. So even if somebody compromised Google Docs and got my KeePass database, I can guarantee you with the length of the password I've got in there, nobody's getting into it. Um, so pretty secure. KeePass is a good one. Um, so two-factor, multi-factor authentication. What is it? Um, two-factor authentication, or 2FA, strengthens access security by requiring two methods, also referred to as factors, to verify your identity. They can include something you know, like a username and password, plus something you have, like a smartphone app, to approve authentication requests. Also, there's little key fobs, a lot of hospitals in that, that generate this random code that at the time you're unlocking, you have to know what that code is. It changes like every 30 seconds. Um, I think Monticello Surgery uses something like that. Um, Two-factor authentication protects against phishing, social engineering, and password brute force attacks because you can't get in with just a password. It requires a second authentication, and it secures your logins from attackers exploiting weak or stolen credentials. Now, this is a quick short. I'm going to play the first 90 seconds or so, but this guy, who looks like he's a little drunk, um, gives a really nice, clear, concise description of how the Google, Google now offers two-factor authentication. Do you ever use the same password for multiple websites? Do you ever sign into Google Mail from public or shared computer? Such actions weaken your password and make it easier to steal. Google now offers two-step verification, an optional security feature that helps protect your account even if your password is stolen or cracked. This new feature helps improve security because signing in requires two things, something you know, your password, and something you have, your phone. It's much like what you might see on your banking website. With two-step verification, you'll get a short numeric code, known as a verification code, on your phone. You'll then enter this in addition to your username and password when you sign in. Let's take a look at how you sign in with two-step verification. After you sign in with your username and password, Google will ask you for a verification code. If you chose to receive a text or voice message when you set up two-step verification, Google will then send it to you on your phone. If you're an Android, BlackBerry, or iPhone user, you can also choose to generate a code on your phone using the Google Authenticator app. Enter the code from your phone. If you trust this computer, you can check this box and you won't be asked for another verification code for 30 days. So just, I thought it was a nice, clear 90 second explanation and a demonstration of how that works. So there's an app called Duo. There's a, a number of these apps nowadays, I think LastPass will do it, where you can set it up to work and the paid version is obviously more Compa compatible with more different kinds of online websites than just the free version. But, but I mean, once again, I'm old school and, and I'm in a hurry and I've got to do a billion things and the last thing in the world I want to have to deal with is multi-factor authentication. But in the end, it's, what, it's like I'm breaking down and I'm going to start doing it because uh, I, I want to know that people can't have access to my bank account or to my Google account or to anything else. Um, and so, yeah, it's convenient, it's, it's security convenient Pretty much never, Keith and I, it's like, it's going to slow you down, but I mean, in the end, it's preventing some serious, I mean, wearing seatbelts isn't necessarily convenient, but think of all the damage and the lives it saves. Um, and this basically is a paragraph that talks about some of the different choices. Um, Google Authenticator, which you can put on Android, iOS, or BlackBerry, Twilio Authy, um, the Chrome Brown, which will work with the Chrome browser as well, Duo Mobile, which is the one I was just talking about. Uh, and then LastPass has recently launched. So basically, if you wanted to find out more about this or find one that's best for you, just on your, when you have a moment at home, just Google for multi-factor or two-factor authentication and you'll find lots of hits. And there's plenty of free apps that'll get the job done for personal uses. Um, so what do you do with employee, with ex-employees? When employees are on the way out the door, um, change all passwords. They basically say change all passwords in the company. I mean, that's a big change for 80 employees simultaneously. If you guys are diligent about not sharing your passwords with each other, then perhaps sharing the, changing the passwords of the employees that were closest to the employee who left or who might possibly have shared it or who that person might have gotten is probably adequate. But once again, if you wanted to, and are you glaring at me or just, okay. He's the security guy. It's like, no, change every password. Just watch it. Okay, but, but if you want it better safe than sorry, you would change all the passwords in the company. Um, 
And for this, and one of the reasons, so, and one of the reasons why we, we are very, very, very adamant, we never share the administrator account, the domain admin account, password with employees. We'll, we'll share it with the owner of a business or the manager of the business who has legitimate need to get in and do something or maybe install an app. But it's like it never, it's, it's never a widespread thing. So it's, it's typically something that we don't have to worry about when an employee leaves because they never knew that password. Um, disable the user account, obviously, as they're walking, before they walk out the door. While they're in the meeting getting fired or quitting, that's when you want to disable their account. It sounds harsh, but I have one employee who, client who had an employee who got out of the meeting of, of a mutual resignation type of deal. And he's like, oh, I just want to get some personal effects off of my computer. And he basically just, while he was sitting there, sitting with the owner of the company, chatting away, he was copying all these different contracts and all that that they had with, with you know, they, they're, a, they're a contractor, like a general contractor. And he was copying all these documents over to his thumb drive, which the owner of the company then found out because they ended up going to another contractor who he was friends with. And so he knew that that employee had stolen those documents. But he also did not have uh, an acceptable use policy in place at the time. This was several years ago, so there wasn't much he could do about it. All right, so disabling user accounts, um, burning all your computers. No, get help if needed. Get professional help if needed. If you have a key employee, um, you know, there are a couple of guys here, Cam and I'm sorry, what was your name? Mike. Mike. Um, who are at the core of the IT. I mean, if they left, you know, if Mike left in a huff, I'm not saying he ever would, he then that, <laughs> he'd never make it out of the parking lot, would he? <laughs> but there are cases where you might have a client of yours who has a key, key employee leave, and you really, and you're like worried because they have access to all the QuickBook files and all this and remote access in. Call in a professional. You know, it can be PJ Networks. We'd be glad to help you or them. Could be whoever they normally use, but just don't, let, don't let your clients think that they can do everything on their own. There are certain things, just like, you know, they can, maybe they can balance a checkbook. Maybe they're good about doing their deposits. Maybe a lot of your clients even have, do a little bit of bookkeeping of their own. But in the end, they're not CPAs. They're not professional accountants. There are certain things they trust to professionals. They should do the same thing with their IT support. So, Phil, so, uh, mm -hmm. I'm assuming also that policy is, goes both ways. You, you may fire somebody and go through that, but somebody may resign or on their own and on good standing, and you should probably go through the same steps. Yes, absolutely. 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 Yeah, yeah and, then, and, and we, actually, no we actually did have a client not long, like within the last month, who had somebody, an accounting firm, who had somebody leave, and it seemed like she left on the most pleasant of terms. Um, but circumstances after she left have started to indicate that perhaps she was just sucking up and, and playing sweet you know, to leave on good terms so that they wouldn't disable her account, so that she could have access back in. Um, and she landed at, a major, at, a, at another accounting firm that is like a direct competitor. And so, any, but we had disabled the account anyway. Basically, instead of disabling the account, what we normally do is before the, while the employee's meeting with the owner of the company, we just change the password so that they can't get into anything, so that after that employee's walked out the door, one of the managers can go and log into the computer under the new password and make sure that they see everything that the employee was working on up to the minute that they left. And then once all that data has been transitioned or moved over to another employee, that's when we would disable the account and then within 30 days go ahead and delete it because you don't need it anymore. But, you know, because the difficulty is, especially if somebody's leaving on good terms, you know, a lot of employment agreements say you got to give them all notice, you got to give two weeks notice. That's... And, you know, they're giving notice, you're letting them still work at their... The yeah, I, mean, I know it's 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 sad, but it's it's a hard rule. But I mean, I have to say that I had one employee who left on 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 not the best of terms. It was years ago. I'm trying to remember how long. It was like six years ago, and it just wasn't a good fit. And it the feelings weren't great between you know it, because it was frustrating for both sides, for me and the employee. And when and so, but I didn't want to be like an a-hole and just like not you know I wanted to give him two weeks like because I'm old school like I'm I'm over 50 I'm old school so I was like okay so I'm not just gonna cut you loose you know you get two weeks notice um, but you know here's your last I gave him this two weeks pay on the way out the door I said I'm paying you for two more weeks of work but I don't want you here right. and I paid him so I mean I met my legal obligation and my moral obligation to not just leave him without a job on that day but I certainly wasn't gonna let his hands back on any of my computers so that was it so Kind of the, you, know, you pay to, to have that the nice handshake goodbye. The um, the percentage that I gave you of most vulnerabilities coming from inside, uh, a substantial portion of that is disgruntled employees. 
you have to have the mindset of protecting yourself, even if somebody leaves on good terms. You, you, you have to. It's just a necessary evil as far as dis, um, disabling accounts, uh, removing access and credentials. There's just no other really, I, I don't know of another way, and I've been in the industry for 25 years and been doing security for about 19. I don't know of another way to do it. Right. Yeah. It's a necessity. And I've never seen it demonstrated in any other organization that I've been at being done any other way. Right. Right. Um, public Wi-Fi use. Um, I'm sure Keith has a ton of, of more information on this than I do. Um, but the basic rules are if you're going to be using public Wi-Fi nowadays, just buy one of these little private $50 a year VPN subscriptions. And what, it, what it'll do is when you fire up that VPN connection, it goes out through the public Wi-Fi, which is open, sort like open, but it creates a tunnel out to a server on the internet, and then everything that you do from that point is, in, is within that secure tunnel. So you're using the free public Wi-Fi, but somebody who is sniffing or analyzing the, the, the wireless would not have access to your data because it's inside, it's being encrypted between point A and point B. So a $50 VPN piece of software, I think I've heard of them cheaper, but 50 seems to be an annual. It's a reasonable price to pay because it kind of means wherever you go, you can use the, wi the wireless and not feel like you're vulnerable. Um, personal protection being in the form of a Bitdefender, uh, some sort of an antivirus, some sort of a malware prevention, um, and keeping your, everything up to date. Um, Staying secure, I think, is basically keeping an eye on your property is in this example. So don't walk away from a computer. Give somebody else a chance to look at what's on the screen or to gain access to the keyboard. Um, and this attractive young lady thinks it's a target-rich environment. So that's an extra reason not to be trusting a public Wi-Fi. And, and why something seemingly so trivial as a public Wi-Fi or public hotspot is a problem is because if anybody's been paying attention over the last year and a half or so, two years, we find um, major vulnerabilities in SSL, in multiple versions of SSL. They co and that's, that's the mechanism that encrypts your web traffic to connect to your bank or to any online purchasing. We find major encryption or major weaknesses in the encryption algorithms that they're using. So once upon a time, you used to be able to be on a public Wi-Fi and say, well, I'm doing something and it's SSL connected, so I'm good. Now that's not such an easy thing because if you're sitting in a uh, Starbucks or some public place and you're, or in, in a park where the city's providing public Wi-Fi, you never know who's sitting there literally capturing traffic. Um, so it actually matters nowadays that you don't do certain things on public hotspots unless you're savvy enough to know how to encrypt the traffic that's leaving your computer. You leave yourself open to potential um, sniffing and capturing of your data just because you were careless or let your guard down. So it, it, it actually matters. Once upon a time, it didn't matter. Now it does. Yeah, and one, and one of the key um, responsibilities that Keith has as he's going out and doing um, both internal and external vulnerability assessments for clients of ours is, is he's finding tons and tons and tons of encryption algorithms and SSL, you know, bit lengths and all that that aren't to the standard that we would like to see them. And those aren't things that we can see just by having them under managed services. Managed services is great for remote support and keeping vir def virus definitions up and keeping Windows patch and third party patch, but it doesn't do an in depth analysis of the actual in framework. We have to send somebody on site with a, a, basically with an analysis tool, and that's what we're doing right now. And and so the key is knowing what to lock down, and then we have to run all of these lockdowns in a test environment because you lock things down too tight, and then you break things. So all of a sudden, for example, you know, we locked one client down, we went one smidge too far, and they reported, well, I'm not getting, I'm not getting email on my phone. You know, email is working fine from from Outlook, from my laptop, but it's not, well, it's because Outlook Web Access, which is kind of it's Internet Information Services, which is how your smartphone gets your email uses encryption algorithms, and one of them had inadvertently been, and that wasn't Keith's fault, that was my fault, um, had just been locked down a little bit too tight, and it was killing one of them that needed to be opened. So. Um, but, but again, maybe a dumb question, but you, you speak of computers, but you're talking about iPads, phones. Yes. Anything. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Any host on a network. Yeah. Mobile devices, all of it. Yeah, so tightening things down so they're tight enough to be secure, but not so tight that things break. And then there's a decision made sometimes when you can't tighten them down as much as you'd like without breaking something, and then it's the client's choice when we explain the risks. Like, these are the risks involved, and these are the benefits, and then we have that discussion. And there are usually ways to mitigate, to work around the issue, leave them secure, but just it takes a little bit more effort. Now, here's a good one for everybody. So has anybody, has everybody, has anybody here ever heard of a skimmer? Um, okay. So... 
I pulled this off of the internet today. So this is an ATM machine, that nice little device. So that's the ATM, that nice little device that looks a lot like it is a skimmer. That device is going to fit snugly over top of the ATM machine and it's going to make it look like it's, so that's what the skimmer installed. So the skimmer has its own magnetic card reader that when you slide your card in, it's reading the card information. So it gets the bank account number and everything. So you're like, okay, so I see that's the skimmer. And, it's, and, and they'll actually, I'm reading articles now that you know, they actually say if it looks the slightest bit suspicious or bulky or in any way, tug on it. Even if it doesn't look suspicious, tug on it a couple times because they'll come off. So you're thinking, okay, well, this, so, so somebody like me is thinking, so fine. So there's a skimmer, but, it's, but how's it going to know my security code, right? How's it going to know? It won't know my four-digit PIN. Well, you see that little thing? That, so that's a brochure holder with a camera right there. And the camera is going to get set up conveniently pointing at the screen of the ATM machine. So somebody like me drives up to an ATM like that, and I slide my card in the skimmer, and then I punch my security code in in front of the camera, and like 24 hours later, somebody's taken $12,988 out of my bank account. And the proof of that is the letter that I had to go to the bank to file to get an inf a, a fraud claim, and the money 24 hours later is now back in my account. But if you see the amount of that, 12, sorry, $12,970.60. Me, yesterday at, at, at BB&T, because I mean, yes, because, because and, and they, they're not 100% sure that it was a skimmer, but what they do know is that on Monday night at 11 p.m., somebody called, and get this, the bank record show was from my mother's home phone. So, and they were explaining that that's becoming more common, where the, the hackers or the people stealing it can actually impersonate somebody else's phone number so the way they did it is they called in on one of these 1-800 banking numbers where you put in your card number and then you put in your, your four-digit PIN and it will then allow you to access your banking information and to make transfers and do whatever you want. So they transferred $10,000 from our business account to my personal AT, to my debit account and then in California, their accomplice or whatever basically made two huge purchases at Walmart and then went out and did $400 debit transactions until they drained the rest of the account dry. And I, of course, I got a call from BB&T when they were on the last round going, Mr. Jadeborg, you're not in California at the moment, are you? And I'm like, no, I'm standing in Charlottesville, Virginia. Well, there's been a lot of unusual activity. Well, damn, it would have been nice if you'd caught that on the first one and not the last one. But the point is, that's the only thing. BB&T is saying that that's their best guess, because otherwise, that means that they're totally vulnerable. If somebody didn't use a skimmer on me, then somebody managed to get my ATM card number and my four-digit PIN without anything that I did. And that would be a scary thought. <laughs> and my mother's phone number. So they, were, they were attempting two-factor authentication that got, and that got compromised by that phone number. Actually, that's a, good, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. And of course, they could have looked up my mother's phone number in the phone book or online. I mean, you know, she's, she lives in Orange. She's been there for the last 40-some years. Anyway, um, so just want to make it real. That's, how, that's what a skimmer looks like. So just see. So just so you'll recognize, that's what it would look like without one. So, 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 I mean, so, like an employee of the bank would not be able to go out in the morning and be able to say, oh, this doesn't look right, or this? You would think that they should. You would think they would take some accountability for that. They told me about another case that happened a year ago, or maybe six months ago, where a hundred instances of this happened, and it, was a, a, and it wasn't a bank. It turned out to be a 24-hour convenience store in downtown Charlottesville, where some, where they, so who was open 24-7, where somebody walked in and put it over the top of like the counter debit machine. And it's like, well, how, how does that happen? The thing with banks is generally it's not the employees of the banks that are managing the ATMs. It's usually a third, a third party, party, like yeah. Diebold yeah. or some, or I don't know, um, Brinks or somebody like that. Yeah. Um, and they may not fill up an ATM machine for four or five days. So they put the skimmer on the front of the ATM. A bank employee is not going to look at it. In four or five days, when Brinks comes by, they might recognize it. But then you've got four or five days worth of data. I would think somebody that every morning, I mean, because typically you would think that would happen overnight. So I would like to think that banks are going to start getting savvy enough to go out every morning and just put an eyeball on it to make sure it's working. So, so, so again, though, it's, it's attached, not secure. So if, you, if it was one there, you probably could pull it off. You probably could pull it off. I mean, there maybe it's a little sticky or a little like sticky tape or Velcro, but nothing. It's not screwed. It's not. It's right. It's not screwed on because it's got, it's got to be a quick deal. Like right? so. Take it off. Yeah. 
They got to come get their. They got to come. What's that? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they can do it anywhere. Yeah. So, but a real life example, and it happened to me. Um, but now I know better, and I'm just going to be a lot more cautious. And the banking lady said, just don't use debit, because if you, didn't use, if you only used your card as a credit card and not debit, then you'd never be punching your pin, and then nobody could get there, get it. It's like, well, doesn't that, well, and I could go over here and rub two sticks together and get fired, but I'd like to think that I'm living in the, but that's what the bank was telling me to do. Anyway, so there you go. Da, 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 da. But if it had been a credit card, though? They said yeah, then if it had been a credit card transaction, then there would have been no PIN for them to get. And the PIN is what they used to call into the bank with. Because that automated, welcome to automated banking. Plug in your card number. Plug in your PIN number. Now you can do anything you want. But if they got your credit card, couldn't they, couldn't they make charge, fraudulent charges, though? With the, with they could the charge. Payment? They just wouldn't be able to withdraw cash. Right. right. They, they could charge. To but cash then, you, but then there's a delay, right? But when, you, when you're doing debit, it's a direct money in somebody's pocket. And when you're charging, it doesn't process for like 24 hours or whatever. So. Have what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, once again, a BB&T said we're covering this. You know, we didn't do it, but we're covering it. Yeah. So, so securely. <laughs> I had to call her on the way over here. On the way over here, and I said, "Mom, just do me a favor and call BB&T. Call your local bank, and just have them glance." I said, "I don't think there's anything wrong, but just have them glance over your because she doesn't do any online banking." And she didn't have a debit card, but I said, I just would have feel better if you made sure that there's no suspicious activities going on. And nothing. I mean, but anyway, so anybody can be a victim between that and Equifax. Um, so social media, a lot of people don't take it seriously enough as being some, a, a way of, of people getting information and getting a, a, a crack in the door for a data breach. <coughs> the same rules apply for credentials. Just because it's Facebook doesn't mean it's not important. Um, for example, with Twitter, um, imagine your company's Twitter account, which represents you to the world, right, to the rest of the community. You know, imagine some cranky old man with a craw, sick in his craw, started just doing wild, crazy Twitters on behalf of your company at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's why we don't let Phil do the Twitter. So, <laughs> so an angry employee could leave the company, and they have your Facebook, and maybe they were taking care of your Facebook for you and your Twitter, and you never thought about it because it's not in-house. And the next morning, you've got all these ugly Facebook posts of like horrible things and, and compromising and embarrassing pictures and all that. So basically, the same rules apply if somebody, you know, if somebody leaves a company and they knew how to get in and do Facebook posts or Twitter or anything else for your company. Um, a, your password should have been complex in the first place so nobody could just simply guess it. B, change that password. Only share what's necessary, so keep it to a key few employees. Remember, the apps are on your phone, so that employee, you know, if, if you didn't think about the Facebook app until the next day, that employee may be sitting in your parking lot before they drive off going, you know, I'll show these guys. This is their Facebook post of the week, you know, so be careful with that. Um, and then update and review frequently. Some companies don't, and probably many of your clients have a Facebook page that they don't use very often. It's just there, and every now, maybe on a holiday or a special occasion. Um, but the danger is, if you never ever look at your Facebook page, people can be posting stuff there and you didn't even know it. So just, and they might be trying to trick people into sending money or, you don't know. So all of your clients who have a Facebook page should either review it at least weekly and update it once in a while or close it down so it's not there. But don't just leave it sitting in the yard until the grass grows so tall that you, know, you don't even know it's there anymore. Um, online buying and selling, I think we all know the basics on this. Look for the lock to show that you've, you know, up on the address bar to show that it's a secure connection. Look for the S and HTTPS for secure. Um, the trusted seal, I only agree with that if you can click on the trusted seal and it takes you somewhere. Like if it says BB, BBB trusted and you click on it, it should take you to Better Business Bureau. If it's just a pretty picture that says trusted, that doesn't need anything more than a cereal box that says new and special. It's nothing but a label. So. Um, and how do you know if that dog food really does taste better than the last one? You, you going to try it? No. Um, so new and trusted. Um, when you're selling, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Make sure all transactions are, are secure. So if you have an e-commerce store, for example, you would absolutely want to have it on a secure website. Um, and then use proven technology. Um, get directions from your bank uh, about what kind of a swiper you're going to use, if you're going to use one of those squares or whatever, which have been found to be vulnerable on the older versions. So be careful about that. 
and then um, only store data securely, the general rule with credit card numbers, also with social security numbers, et cetera, but credit card numbers, um, you only keep them in an encrypted location on your network if you have to keep them on behalf of your clients. Um, and if you're gonna write them down on a piece of paper, it either has to be locked in a filing cabinet or better yet, shred it if you don't need to keep it. Um, and calling somebody with a big transaction. If, you know, encourage your clients who are gonna spend large chunks of money on things, um, if they haven't worked with a vendor before and it's a large payment, they should call and speak to that vendor first. Uh, quickly gonna run through this. So there's PCI compliance. Basically, anybody who processes credit cards has to follow PCI compliance. We can go into more detail, but th th there's, every business out there who takes payments has a, a PCI compliance questionnaire on an annual basis, so you guys have probably all seen them before and had to help your clients get through them. Um, a quick analysis of one of our clients, not, actually it was a potential client, four or five years ago, I think four years ago, uh, I ran a data breach scan risk on their server, and because I knew that they didn't have uh, any kind of encryption on their server, and they were an account, a very small accounting firm. And I basically said, I'll give you a free network vulnerability scan on your server to show you that you've got vulnerabilities there, even though I've never really worked with your data because they weren't my client. And when I got done, I showed 153,363 worth of, um, of, of violations. You can't really make out the numbers there. There were 600 and some violations, and they were primarily all uh, social security numbers. And because they had everybody, all their, and they were sitting on a server that was unsecured with not a whole lot of protection. Uh, and it made me a little bit nervous. And it turns out that 81% of the, this has nothing to do with the vulnerabilities. That just says that if somebody hacked that server and took all the data on it, the federal government would come in and fine them that much money. That wouldn't include civil penalties or lawsuits or anything. That would be a per incident fee for every social security number that was breached. Um, and then it turned out that the, of the vulnerabilities I found, 81% of them were Adobe software. They just had an outdated Adobe Flash Player, Adobe Acrobat, et cetera. It would have been very easy to put encryption on the main folder where they kept their data and to update their software and to get them in a, in a much better stance. They decided that with the data I provided them, they could take care of it on their own, but they were non-technical, so you know, who knows? Um, security risk analysis are important. A lot of times, medical, in most cases, medical offices need to be having um, a risk analysis done on an annual basis by an outside third party. So for those of you who work with medical offices and any kind of health provider, remember PJ Networks provides those kind of vulnerability assessments and scans and remediation. Myth or fact, I'm not on the internet, so I'm safe. Myth. Um, so myth simply because a thumb drive, you know, thumb drive you find in the parking lot, Somebody could have cleverly dropped it right in the, next to the front door knowing you were gonna walk by and there's a, uh, an infection at the root of that and the second you come inside and go, wow, I'm gonna be a good Samaritan and plug this into my computer and find out who owns it so I can give it back to them. You plug it in and it executes and it suddenly starts aggressively going through all of your data files on the entire network. So just don't. I mean, I might at home disconnect my laptop from everything else in the world and plug it in because I'm a bold soul and I have a laptop that I don't keep anything important on. So I would be curious what's on there, but I certainly would not do it on, on, a, on an important home computer or in a, or in a business computer because it's, that, that's a common way that hackers get into a facility is to drop thumb drives like you know, here and there and hope somebody will pick it up and bring it inside and plug it in. Cam actually did that, right? Yeah, he did that. With the no before, right? When using no before. Um, <laughs> so, you've been compromised, hopefully not. Now what do you do? What your clients need to know, what you're going to be helping them educate them on, is number one, um, disconnect and lock down. Unplug the network cable, pull the power cord if it's a desktop computer, hold the power button down for 10 seconds if it's a laptop, um, get the system down and, and minimize the damage, and if you suspect uh, if, you, if you suspect a breach came from within, um, yeah, came from within your organization locking the system down uh, will help. How quickly would you have to do that? Like instantaneously. But we have had cases where clients, because I'd actually told them what the symptoms were of ransomware, they actually had their computer do the freeze lock reboot, and before the thing could even come back up, they, had, they, they unplugged it. 
And then when it came, to, they brought it to our shop, and we found ransomware. It just hadn't. And I think it, I don't think it had infected the first file yet, but I mean it would have. It definitely would have. But they they saw the signs, so everybody's going to freak out every time your computer reboots on its own. Um, within the first 24 hours, you want to uh, the you have to inform the affected parties. So if it was you guys got breached, you'd have to tell your clients, look, we've had a data breach. We don't know whether or not your data was breached, but we just have. To, it's our obligation to tell you all. And you also should make the authorities, uh, the appropriate authorities, it's different for different organizations. For medical, for medical uh, facilities, um, there's one way, to, there's one avenue you have to report it. For financial is another, for law firms is another. Ultimately, if, if, if investigation gets, gets uh, initiated, the FBI, if it's a big enough case, will come in. And that's one of the things that they do a lot. How did Equifax get away from that? Uh, individually uh, notifying if you've been That's a good question. And I found on an MSN uh, uh, article, for said I clicked on a, a link in that article. Probably not, probably not, probably not. That's a, from MSN. Yeah. Were you able to actually check if you were one yeah. of the? Oh, and are you? Yep. But is it my wife wasn't? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. But that's what Did, were there any recommendations of what to do? Uh, they actually, you can enroll, they're going to provide one year, which includes uh, up to a million dollars of uh, uh, some kind of insurance policy. And, and Through Equifax? Yeah. Like that they'll pay for it? Yeah. Okay, well. But the breach happened six weeks ago. Yeah, and, and they knew about it six weeks ago. The government said somebody did. Yeah. Everybody knows what to do when you get home tonight. One, and why wasn't that encrypted? The data encrypted? That's a good question. I mean, it would. I mean, I thought, I thought you just said that the government required you to encrypt Social Security numbers. Well, it does. It does. So you think about the 143 million dollars times. I think it's it's either 120 or 180 dollars. I think it's 180 for a Social Security number. So whatever 143 million times 180 is, that would be what their penalty should be. But I can almost guarantee you they're going to get away with a slap on the wrist. But I'm yeah. just a cynic. Um, so inform your parties, uh, the, the involved parties. Resolve whatever issues you can so you can resume operations because obviously a day down is lost revenue. So, I mean, I know it seems like you'd be in crisis mode, but you still have to run a business. Um, and then you should know what an hour of downtime costs you. You know, this young lady, she has a small plumbing business. It costs her $500 an hour to be down. I bet it would cost a few, few more dollars than that for Hansman and Weeble to be down. So, you know, payroll is expensive and lost revenue. Have you guys actually been able to put a quantifiable number to that? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so these companies were compromised. What can we learn from that? Target, Home Depot, City, Sony, the wall of shame, Yahoo, Zappos, and, and now... countless government entities that have not been publicized. Yes. And now Zappos, uh, I mean, now Equifax. Um, what do we learn? Well, from their example, at least... Own it. You can't deny it. You can't pretend it's not true. You, it's like, own it. Accept responsibility for it so that people know they can believe you. Fix it and fast, and then prevent it from ever. It can't ever happen again. Statistics do not favor your business survival otherwise. Um, one statistic that, I did, for some reason, didn't come up on the slide, 60% of businesses, I think, that suffer a data breach are out of, like, go out of business within the next 12 months. It might be six months, but I think it's within 12 months. They go out of business. They can't sustain not, not only the financial loss, but the hit and the reputation. Nobody would want to bank at a bank, for example, that got breached, a large-scale breach. Um, and, but see, with Equifax, it's kind of unfair, and we could get on a whole, I could get on a podium here. It's unfair because I didn't ask them to keep my credit score. I didn't ask them to keep my Social Security number. They did it to me from my benefit, and now my data has been breached. And I can't do a darn thing about it, and I, we, I can't hold them accountable. And somebody else could be out there stealing my identity as we speak. So, I mean, it's, where, where do you go with that? Um, wire uh, fraud uh, transfers are becoming more prevalent, and we had several examples of that in the last cybersecurity seminar. Uh, there were examples of it that were brought up by First Citizens Bank, where they've actually seen these in action. Um, and they talked about one case that had recently happened in California where somebody was able to get information on a pending real estate transaction. If I'm remembering the details correctly, a young couple that inherited a million dollars because one of their relatives passed away, they were about to buy their dream home. Somehow somebody hacked into the real estate offices 
inform and got the information about the transaction and then sent them an email telling them to wire the money to such and such account with such and such routing number. And they referenced the right property, the right names, everything looked right. And without picking up the phone to verify that it was legitimate, they did it. And a million dollars went pew, like that. And depending on who was, at, who was at fault, who knows if they'll get the money back. Um, be suspicious if you're asked to transfer or send money, if you don't 100% recognize the company or contact, if, if, you're, if there's no available legitimate phone number you know, on the transaction, a hacker will break into licensee's email account, just what I was talking about, and gain information about upcoming financial transactions, and then they will send an email to the buyer. The easiest way to, get it for, to avoid this from happening to you or anybody you know is anytime you get an email telling you you need to transfer a bunch of money, pick up the phone and verify it. Call somebody. Call somebody who would know. That solves the problem. Um, this is a sample of a phishing email that are telltale signs, um, basically from sysadmin at itsecuritygroup.com, um, basically saying due to recent security breaches in the industry, Congress, see, <laughs> Congress has mandated higher information security standards. So they're basically asking you to click on this link to test and see if your password is compliant. And if you clicked on that link, they'd ask you to please enter your password so we can tell you whether or not it's, you know, it's compliant, if it's strong enough and then somebody's got your password. So the tells on this are, and a good spam filter would have weeded this out in a heartbeat. Subject and sender don't sound, don't look legitimate. They totally am ambiguous. Um, supposed authority, Congress has mandated that we have to do such and such. Asking for your password, very, very, very big telltale. Most banks, financial institutions, Everybody nowadays basically says we will never ask you to reveal your password um, in an email. Something else that's kind of very important to realize is, and in today's world, many of you in this room might know this, but that little blue link there, HTTP password test at itsecurity-group.com, hovering over that and verifying that the actual link that you're going to is the same as the text will give you a good sense if the 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 URL, when you hover over that link, is different than the URL that's being proposed to you there. There's some, something fishy going on, and it's obvious that you wouldn't want to click on that link, and you'd want to report it to your system administrator. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times when I hover over those for clients who forward their emails onto me, they'll end, they end in RU. They're Russian. So, I mean, the, the, at the end, if you ever have to, if you're ever going to click on a link and the last two digits are .ru, don't do it unless you want to learn how to speak Russian. A lot of users don't realize that the link text and the actual place it takes you to are t can be totally two different things. Yeah. So it says password test IC security, but to his point, it can be a Russian link or any other type of link taking you to a website that's going to force feed you some code. And just taking the five seconds that it takes to hover your mouse over a link in an email that you get to verify that the link, that the uh, URL that shows up for the link is they're one and the same, at least gives you a sense it came from a legitimate source. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's part of phishing. That's, that's how they'll do it. They'll make the link look legitimate, but the actual place it's going to take you is um, going to be for their, going to be for their ends. But yeah. Aren't there some instances where even hovering over something can cause you a problem? No. No? No. Well, You're not executing okay. anything. Okay. You're not executing anything at that point. No, but there, have, but there are certain infections that can be embedded. So if you, looked, if, if you had an email that came into Outlook and you were setting up your auto preview, and I don't believe in using the preview pane in Outlook, because it's exposing you to the contents of an email. And if an email had a link back to the internet, they could, infections can be embedded in a single pixel in an image. So if you're using auto preview and Outlook, and you've got the preview pane up, and you get an infected email that automatically opens, then yes, sometimes just opening an email can launch an infection. It's rare, but I, mean, I saw four or five years ago, there was a little string of those that went around, but then the antivirus software started realizing that there were ways to, to kind of screen those out. Uh, and then they're talking about spelling and grammar, and very, very, very often do I notice when somebody forwards me an email, I don't even have to check the links to tell it's not legitimate because it's got really bad grammar or something is misspelled that shouldn't be. Um, so, yeah, typically a phishing email will look suspicious. A lot of it is just really common sense and choosing to apply the common sense to your daily activities on the computer because we all apply common, well, most of us, apply da common sense in our daily activities moving around the, in, you know, in the world. But when we get focused on the computer, all of a sudden common sense kind of leaves people's brains yeah. um, when it comes to simple things like checking links. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, physical security, there's a quick walk through this, but it's the common sense things, lock the doors to the office. Um, wait a minute, what's that? Lock before you leave, lock the doors too. Don't leave your computer sitting out on a table at the coffee shop while you go up to the register. I mean, I would less, it's really pretty darn close and you can beat somebody to it before they steal it. Um, don't save your remote desktop or remote banking passwords or anything like that because if somebody grabs your laptop and walks, they've got all that. Um, and then homes are high target values or high value targets. So you would want to make sure that you're not leaving obvious entrances to get to your, to your data. Like if you, if, you have, if you don't have an alarm system in your home or you think it's not the secure location where you're keeping the computer, don't store any cached usernames or passwords. Um, quick example, indications uh, of malware. You get a pop-up from a program you don't have. <laughs> Slow browsing. I had one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Redirected well browsing. That's where you do a Google search for maybe like lawnmowers, and then you see a link, and you're like, oh, I want to go to check Lowe's out. And when you click on it, it takes you to Bubba's lawnmowers. It's like it's not what you came up in your Google. That's called a redirect. So, you know, if you start going doing Google searches and you're going, you're clicking on links that aren't taking you where you thought you were going, that's a redirect. And it's not, a, it's not necessarily infecting you, but it's taking you where they want you to go. So um, you'd want to let Mike know so he could get that cleaned up for you. And sometimes it's a DNS redirect where your computer is getting addresses from a, from a, from a fake source. Uh, and then pop-up messages. Congratulations. This one, this is one that I personally put on here because it, it rubs me the wrong way when I see pictures of, of famous actors like, you know, Michael Douglas. You know, he's gone at 72. Notice it says sponsored. That's the dead giveaway. Um, it ambiguously implies that, that Michael Douglas has, has passed away when he actually had not. Um, you know, even I was, because I like the actor, I was tempted to click on it. But then I was like, wait a minute. This is on the right-hand side of Facebook. I'm not going to click on it. A.K.A. So, clickbait. Yeah. So I just Google, you know, is Michael Douglas dead? And Snopes was like, no, there have been all kinds. And there was Michael Douglas. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was uh, the Hulk, uh, Hulk Hogan. It was all these. But, I mean, they always say Sylvester Stallone. It's like, you know, all the actors are like, oh, he died. And your emotional response is to just click on it with it before you think. That's where you get the nastiest infections. For, I'm not kidding you. Um, and then this type of virus warning that pops up on your computer because you do click on something like that, um, telling you never, ever, ever, tell all of your clients, please, never, ever, 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 ever call a toll-free number or any number that pops up on the screen as a pop-up. It's always hackers, and they will literally say, I just need to, and we're in a really thick foreign accent, I, you, I need, I can fix, I work, I'm, we, I'm Microsoft, I need to fix your computer, I please click on this link, and, and they walk you through getting their remote connected. And while they're on the surface looking like they're trying to fix something, underneath they're, they're grabbing information. They are literally sealing it. And when they get disconnected, they've usually built the person. They've gotten the person to give them a credit card number, and they've charged them $400 for cleaning their computer. In most cases, the person gives them the credit card number, and then they get off the phone, and the computer's in worse shape than it was when they made the phone call. And in some cases, they've actually had their bank accounts cleaned out. We had one lady who did have her bank account cleaned out. So never, ever, 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 ever call the toll-free number that pops up. So the realities for small business, there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be. That was Robert Mueller. I don't know if anybody's heard of that guy. <laughs> Apparently, he was formerly with the FBI. I don't necessarily believe that's true, but it does mean that we have to be, and I'm, you know, anymore I'm starting to feel more vulnerable. Um, according to Symantec, near half of all cyber attacks are now levied against small businesses. 60% of companies breached never recover. Um, and then some outdated numbers for the amount of damage per incident. Those, they're way higher than that now. Um, I found this on my own. There's a website called Small Biz Trends. They talked to small businesses, allowed the, for companies that got hacked, that they knew were hacked, they went and surveyed them, and they were allowed to give more than one answer, which is why this adds up to more than 100%. 49% of them said it was a web-based attack. 43% uh, said phishing or social engineering, so they clicked on a link or opened an attachment they should have. General malware, SQL injection, compromised stolen devices, denial of services. Um, and more in, but I think more interestingly, what were the root causes of the data breaches your business experienced? Not one of those business owners said it was my fault. I let my company down. 48% said it was a negligent employee or contractor. My IT guy shouldn't have let that happen. 41%, third-party mistakes. It was a piece of software I used, and it let somebody in. 35%, there was an error in the system or operating system. 32%, don't know. 
it's shameful, but I mean, not one of them seems like had the audacity or had the, the integrity to say, you know what, I let my company down. I didn't do what I should have done to protect it, and it got hacked. So I think it says a lot that the first thing everybody does is go like this. It was somebody else. But when the FBI walks through the door and you're the owner of that company and your customer's data has been, has been breached, you can do this all you want. They're just going to make you do like this so they can walk you out to the car. But it doesn't matter who you blame because in the end, you're responsible for it. So you're responsible. I think you guys know that. For your client's data, they're responsible for their client's data. Finally, wrapping up, what, do you, what should you know now? Further your education. Assess your situation, which Mike and Cam got you guys under good control. Um, improve your situation. These are obviously recommendations for your clients. Um, you might want to make sure you, you know this link because every one of your customers and clients can go to that link, smallbigbizthreat.com forward slash Virginia. There's training materials. There's PDFs. There's a do-it-yourself education course that each one of them can do, and they'll come out of it a lot more aware. So just kind of showing the link up again up there. Um, this is basically just pointing out that there's certain things that a managed service provider like PJ Networks can do, and you can bring in professional assistance to do other things like firewalls and securing your network, but your clients themselves have to be responsible for enforcing their own security policies, providing their new employees with training, um, practicing the best security practices, I mean, lock your screen when you walk away if you've got sensitive data, keep cybersecurity alive within the office environment, correct each other when necessary, tell the person next to you, hey, you walked away and your screen's got Mrs. Jones's financial information all over it. Um, and then if there, if there are repeat offenses and you feel like that employee next to you is seriously putting the future of this company at risk, you have to turn them in. I mean, you know, I, and I'm not like a snitch loving kind of person, but if you literally think that there's a person in your company who's so lackadaisical about security that they could bring Hansman and Weeble down, you'll be doing yourselves and the partners and owners a favor by letting somebody know so that they can be educated. Um, once again, if anybody has any questions after this, uh, you can email security at pj-networks.com and we'll answer them. Or if you ever want to forward an email that looks suspicious, you have an in-house IT guy, Mike, seems to be on top of the game. Um, but once again, anybody, whoever has it, even if it's a personal computer question, feel free. Um, and just a quick walkthrough, personal home router, easy to hack. Um, Netgear, Linksys, and many other wireless routers, easy to hack. Just because something says Cisco, in most cases nowadays it's not, it's actually Linksys. Um, how to hack a TP-Link router. This was a free YouTube video. I could have watched it and in three minutes learned how to hack somebody's home TP-Link router. I don't know how to hack them, but I mean, if I wanted to, I could learn in three minutes. Once again, how to hack any TP-Link router. So, it's just yeah. taking advantage of the weak. So if you, um, hashing out a, a yeah. So if you see clients of yours out in the field that have these home-looking routers that just don't look like their business class, tell them that they really need to be doing better than that. Um, was that hack a, a TP link with a cell phone? Yes. With okay. WPS Connect, yeah, with a cell phone. Um, so, um, the good news is, well, the bad news is we're running long. The good news is, I think we've covered all of the questions that are in the questionnaire. So, we're going to run through those. And in fact, to make sure we get to those before the end of the day, let's do those next. And then, if there's any time left over, if anybody wants to ask us any questions, I'll be glad to hang out. But the reason I wanted to go through the whole presentation is because it really does cover everything that we're going to cover on the self-assessment questionnaire. Uh, let me bring it up on the screen. Well, let's go back one. It should be clickable. Well, of course not. I've got a copy of it right here. So the purpose of this is to give every one of, every one of our clients, small business clients, and every one of yours, if they're, if they're interested in, in filling it out, uh, an opportunity to feel where they are in the grand scheme of things. How, how secure are they on a scale from one, to, on, from 1 to 100, with most businesses falling between 20 and on the higher end of things. Oh, come on, computer. Work with me. There we go. Let's go full screen on it. Actually, let me do this. Duplicate. All right. There it goes. Okay, and I put glasses down somewhere. 
right in front of me. Okay, um, so the first question, so there are 19 questions. The first one weighing the heaviest because I think how much, and, and this, it's, up to the, it's up to your clients to be honest with you and to be honest with themselves. Um, anybody could lie their way through this and say that there are a 10 or a 5 on every single question. The same way many, many, many companies, excuse me, lie their way through their PCI compliance self-questionnaires. You know, a lot, of, a lot of banking institutions, credit card processors will simply allow a client every year to fill out a questionnaire. And everybody knows that if you answer no, like every question has to be answered with a yes, because if you answer a no to any one of those questions, then they won't, they won't give you a pass on PCI compliance, and you have to pay more every month. Yes, sir? The same is true on, a, on like cybersecurity insurance. Big time. If you, get, if you try to buy that, or if our clients are trying to buy it, and they get a questionnaire, and they answer it the way they think they, you know, that they want it, it answered. It should be answered so that they you know, either get a good rate or whatever. If they don't answer it correctly, and they have a breach, they're the not going to pay. Yes, right. Because that, that's the first thing they're going to go back to and says, well, you said you had this, this, and this in that Absolutely. questionnaire. And you didn't have that, so we're not going to pay. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. One of those questions is usually, has your company within the last year or, two, two, or 24 months had a third-party vulnerability assessment to verify that you're secure? Um, another one of those questions is, are you using some form of encryption to store your client-sensitive data or credit card numbers? And, so if they said yes, that's a good example. So if they said yes on the form, and then three months later they got breached and they've got a million dollar cybersecurity insurance policy, and then that company comes in to investigate and says, well, you said on the form that your data was encrypted. Oh, oh, I thought it meant that was my data cryptic. You know, oh, encrypted, I don't know what that is. Well, boom, you just, the claim is thrown out the window, they're off the hook. So, I mean, people think they're getting one over on the cybersecurity insurance, but in the end, the only person who's going to suffer is going to be the person who's lying on the form. So the first question, on a scale from 1 to 10, being the high 10, always 10 highest rating, 1 slowest. In some cases, there are zeros. How important is cybersecurity? And you just, and it's, it's mostly to give you a feel sitting down. If you sit down with, the, with a client of yours and say, how important is cybersecurity for you on a scale of 1 to 10, and they just go, 1? You might as well just fold it in half and walk out the door. Say, well, it was nice talking to you, Mrs. Jones, and let me know if you change your mind. Because you can't, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You know, on the other hand, if they go 10 on that first question, as you go through the other questions and there are areas that they're really lacking in, you can say, they can say, well, I don't really care. And, what, and you can say, well, that's interesting because you said at the beginning that you were interested as a 10, and now every time you've had an opportunity to improve something, you're saying you don't want to do it. So maybe we should go back to that first question and make it a five because you really, and it's not calling them a liar. It's just being, it's one of those areas in life that you can, you know, you can't BS your way out of it. You either, you either give a darn or you don't. Um, so what level of secrecy is being forced? Like I said, these questions were really literally made to be end user friendly. Um, so, you know, whether you're keeping passwords, no passwords are being used to predict data. Everyone uses the same. We see this all the time where four people in a small business, everybody logs in as administrator with the same password because whoever set up the, the network didn't know enough to set up individual user accounts. I'm sure Mike's seen that in smaller businesses too. So everybody's logging in with administrator and the same password. That's, I'll give you a one simply because some, there's a password. Um, all user accounts are unique, but they all use the same password. User accounts and passwords are unique for each user, but they know each other's passwords. User accounts and passwords are unique for each user and kept private. Um, the password's unique and complex for each user and kept private. They get a five. So in order to get a five, they have to do everything just right. Uh, question three, what level of password complexity? Once again, I think fairly self-explanatory. Anything can be used for a password regardless of length or complexity. They must be at least eight characters long, would get you a one. Eight characters long and cannot be names or dictionary words, that would be a two. Passwords must be at least 12 characters long and use complexity, that would be a three. They must be at least 16 characters long and use complexity, that's a four. They must be at least 16 characters long and are randomly generated. That would give you a five. Once again, there's probably gonna be a little bit of judgment call. If you ask your client, well, how are you using generating passwords? Well. It's 47 characters long, and it's the first initial of every one of my grandchildren. Okay, well, that give, you know, that's, doesn't have to be randomly generated. It's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but once again, you get a sense from, from zero to five how secure they are with their passwords. And 
as we go through these questions, this is the, the place where if you, something's not clear, just raise your hand and we'll stop and make sure that you're clear. Um, what level of security is implemented within your organization to separate different kinds of information, financial, from legal, from medical, from HR, and then access to it? No security organization, everyone can access everything. Um, <coughs> that's a zero. <coughs> data is organized by type, but no specific permissions have been set. But at least you've separated the data, which gives the potential for encrypting something. Um, data is organized by type, and staff is allowed to access it based on the need for each type of data. That's a four. Data is organized by type, access is assigned by user, and access is monitored and logged, meaning that there's, there's folder security monitoring going on so that if somebody's getting into the wrong areas, it's easy to go back later and be able to verify that. So that's the highest level of security. <laughs> what level and or type of internet web filtering is being used? None. Web browsing is not restricted, monitored, or filtered in any way. Um, that Most of your clients are going to be in that boat. Um, number one, minimal. Employees are told what websites are acceptable and expected to comply. Light, antivirus software on the computer system blocks users from infected websites. A lot of good antivirus will do that, for example. It'll like Viper Internet Security will, has a huge list of online uh, websites that it knows that if you try to go to them, they're infected, so that it'll block you. <coughs> Medium, software on each workstation blocks websites by category and reputation, so you could say we don't want people going to gambling sites, porn sites, or disreputable sites. Um, heavy, a gateway unified threat management, so some sort of a firewall and web filtering, uh, appliances being used to manage the network uh, internet connectivity, which means you've got logs that you can go back through later. And then maximum, a unified threat management appliance only allows users to visit approved websites. All others are blocked. And I did have to put in one like that for a client one time that was really, really upset with his employees for watching ESPN when he had customers walking out on his, on his retail sales floor. So when he, we put in the web filter, he said, block all internet access except for these 12 websites that they need to get to. And then we fluffed that out to like, a do, like another dozen. And then within a year, we started letting people get to the internet. But I mean, for a year, it was really, really hard times there. So that would be a five. That's the maximum is blocking. Has anybody seen that new, there's a guy who sells this antivirus, PC something or other. He's a really nice looking man who goes, 100% foolproof, never been blah, blah, blah. Well, how it works is it only allows you to websites that you've added to the safe list. So when you install the software, it's blocked all internet activity and then you add websites one at a time as you want to go to them, well, that's pretty darn secure. I wouldn't call it a great antivirus or PC protection, but I mean, it's draconian, but it would certainly get the job done. You know, it's like saying, I don't want my son to marry the wrong person, so he's never leaving the house or meeting anybody. Like, yeah, well, then good chance he won't. <laughs> um, okay, six, what kind of computer antivirus solution does your organization use? And once again, since we're pushing right at five, I'm gonna, I'm just kind of glancing through. I'm, I'm going to look for any questions that I think have anything that would look um, even slightly confusing. And if you guys want to just do the same, kind of look through them as I'm skimming through them. So one is basically a straightforward. Number six is a straightforward question about what kind of antivirus solution and whether it's centrally managed. So a five would be all systems running a monitored antivirus and there's a gateway threat solution. Multi layers of protection are always preferred. So you've got it on the workstation level and you've got it on the internet connection level. Um, what kind of backup solution does your organization use? And that goes from a zero, none, all the way up to full server system backups are performed hourly and replicated to, to cloud storage daily. But then the other choices on between A and B or zero and five are, are all typically going to be one and two are going to be what most of your clients are probably working with. How often does your organization perform test data recovery? That's a biggie. So many clients that we've taken over from other support companies in the past, we say, let us see your backups. Well, here's the tape I've been swapping out, or here's the hard drive I swap out every day. And we plug it in, and there's nothing on it. Or the last time a good backup was gotten was like eight months ago. And they're astounded. They're like, really? They said all I had to do was swap it out. It's like you've never looked to make sure the data was actually there. No, we just swap it out, and the little light blinks tell them, so really, I mean, they should at least, you know, monthly is probably a little draconian. I mean, weekly is probably a little draconian. For our clients, when we do their monthly server checkups, we do a little piece of test data. We delete it from the server. It's like a test file. And then we go to the backup, and we bring it back from backup to make sure that it's working. 
Sometimes even if the backup looks like it's good, when you go to restore the data, it won't. And that's not something you want to find out after a ransomware. How many people in your organization know the master administrator password with full system control and access to all data on the network? And once again, that's from a zero, meaning uh, everyone, or they don't know who knows, or number five, meaning only the person trusted with managing user accounts and data security. Uh, question 10, what kind of email antivirus and spam filtering solution are you using? Zero being nothing or don't know, all the way up to five. Once again, a multi-factored solution um, where they've got an antivirus on the individual computers that are doing the spam and virus filtering, and there's some sort of a unified method filtering on the internet gateway level. And Mike, do you, have, do you guys have some, something on that level, right? On the, between you and the internet? That, yeah, I, I figured you would. Um, a number 11, is user access control turned on for the workstations? And then I give you an explanation. It's the notification that pops up whenever you install software or make changes to the computer system. You can tell pretty easily. I mean, if you go to download a piece of software from the internet, even if it's some little freebie or whatever, and then you go to install it, if you get a pop-up on your computer saying you need administrator permission to install this, that's user access control. If people can install anything they want willy-nilly, those are the clients that we get the most virus cleanup work from. Um, at least turning on user access control means they'll get a warning before they get infected. And ransomware will pop up the warning before it installs itself, so that's really a telltale sign. If you get that warning and it says, I'm about to change something on your computer, and you didn't expect that, then that, that's click no and don't do it. Um, number 12, what kind of internet firewall does your organization use? Once again, one being a don't know. Two being an easy uh, modem router provided by the internet service provider, which is certainly better than nothing. Um, using a wireless or home personal firewall router will give them a three, simply because if they're not a high profile target, chances are you know they're, the numbers are in their favor that they're not going to have anybody sitting outside trying to hack them. Um, going all the way up to a business class firewall solution, that's a five. Who is allowed to connect to their, their personal devices to your wireless network connection. And a zero being anyone, it requires nothing, it's wide open, anybody walking down the street can get into it. Um, and number four, only to a dedicated guest access wireless protection like you guys have, which also has a guest passcode, it's not just wide open. Um, and then five, which is very draconian, no one is allowed to connect personal devices to our wireless network. But I mean, if you're letting guests do it, then chances are you're letting, you know, you let your employees do it as well, as long as it's guest access. So technically that, you know, number four probably should count as a five as well. But, you know, we're shooting for a maximum to, to minimum, and maximum would be no personal devices. Number 14, who is allowed to connect flash drives or thumb drives to their computers at the office? Most businesses have no restriction policy. Anybody can plug any thumb drive. That's the probably number one way that people, employees, walk away with data because they don't have to send it via an email or leave a trace. They plug a thumb drive in their computer, they download a bunch of client contracts, they stick them in their pocket, and they walk out the door. Um, and then the, most, the strongest one, only authorized members of the staff using a company-owned flash drive on certain computers. So they can be locked down via group policy, so maybe only one computer in each department or one person in each office has access to the thumb drive so that you can control which data comes and goes from the network. Uh, 15, how is financial, medical, and or personal identifying information stored on your computers, and what kind of security is in place to protect it? Um, number one, um, first one, which is a zero on the scale from one to zero to five, it might be found on any computer with no protection or security in place, um, and that works its way all the way up to all of the data of this type is consolidated and kept on a single encrypted hard drive in a secure location. That would get you a five. And the federal government does have something called safe harbor. If you get, if they're going to do a security audit, especially if it's a, if it's a um, HIPAA compliance, uh, and you have like social security numbers or patient data or driver's license numbers, and it's kept in a encrypted location on your network, you get what's called safe harbor. It's a safe pass. You're, they're not going to find you for that um, because you did due diligence to, to protect that data. What software-based firewall or Windows or third party is running on your computers to protect against the internal spread of a worm virus or hostile attack from another computer on your network? WannaCry is the first virus we've seen in a long time that was actually trying to worm its way to other computers. 
All of these crypto walls and ransomwares you've been hearing about for years were all one hits. One email came in, hit a target, they opened it, they infected the entire network or compromised all the data, but it did not spread itself to other computers on the network. WannaCry actually would go out and start looking for other computers on the network to infect, which is why it spread so quickly. You know, that wasn't 200 million emails that went out to infect people, that was probably a thousand emails that went out to infect 200 million computers. And it was specifically looking for the unpublicized vulnerability in the Microsoft operating system that Microsoft didn't even know about, so it was literally able to walk through all these machines. Yes, yes. Yeah. They weren't patched. With nobody even suspecting that it was happening until the damage was done. Um, so basically from a zero being um, Windows firewalls turn off on all computers to avoid software issues, that's the lazy way out. We see that a lot where somebody was trying to install QuickBooks or some other application and they couldn't get it open, they couldn't get it to work because the firewall ports needed to be opened properly and they just turned the Windows firewall off. Well, now you've got a computer that's just sitting there vulnerable to anything that wanders along. Um, unknown but not intentionally turned off. That's a two out of five. Windows, other firewall turned on for most systems, turned off on others. That's a three. Windows, other firewall turned on for all computer systems, a four turned on and monitored on all systems on the network, that gets you a five. Uh, I think we're three more questions. How are, the, how are Microsoft Windows updates managed and installed in your organization, on your organization's computer systems? Um, answer number zero, unknown. Um, works its way all the way up to Windows and Microsoft updates are managed and monitored network-wide from a console, either in-house or by a professional managed IT solution provider. For smaller businesses, you can get by with one person who's tech savvy, manually eyeballing each computer, let's say once a week to make sure they're staying up to date. But any bigger than like 10 computers or more and you really want something where somebody can glance at a console and see that every computer on the network is up to date. I can almost guarantee you that Mike's got some sort of a solution like that where you can just, you know, Mike and Cam know if somebody's missing a software patch or if their firewall is turned off, they can, they can tell at a glance. Question 18, how are third-party software updates, Adobe, Java, iTunes, those are, the first two are biggies, managed and installed on your organization's computer systems? A zero is unknown. Two, we install software updates when prompted by the software program, so it's better than nothing. Um, four points, four, we use software, antivirus, or other packages to check for updates and prompt us to install. Five, third-party software updates are managed and, managed and monitored network-wide from a console by our IT service provider or by somebody in-house. And the final question is, what ongoing training, and, and this is a biggie, another biggie, what ongoing training and data security awareness does your organization provide to your employees in order to ensure they are knowledgeable, aware, and diligent in their data security practices? None gets them a zero. We hold annual data security meetings and training sessions. Jumps them all the way up to a two, because you'd be surprised how many companies don't do anything. Um, each employee is provided with a training manual <coughs> upon joining our organization. That would be a three. And hopefully that's in conjunction with an annual training session. We provide cybersecurity training manuals to new employees and hold quarterly meetings. That would be four. That would be pretty good, better than the average. And finally, we provide access to online training resources. We test employee security awareness and knowledge <coughs> with quizzes and tests. We have monthly meetings to discuss data security and best practices. And if not monthly meetings, then maybe monthly memos, I think would be good enough. Um, so the idea here is not to make your, your, your own clients feel guilty <coughs> or feel negligent in any way. And I can pretty much guarantee you that even if you, even if you be nice to them, even if you give them the benefit of the doubt, whenever you see a three that could possibly be interpreted as a four, even if you give them, give them, give them the one, the one-offs, if they really want to argue, well, I don't think that's being fair, you know, I'd say, that's fine. We'll give you a three then instead of a two, because I can, obviously, you met well. I mean, it doesn't matter, because in the end, the numbers will average out. And I think you're going to find that people fall anywhere from about a tw the lower end, the, low, the lowest common factor you're probably going to see among your clients is going to fall in the 15 to 20 point range, where they're really not much doing much of anything, but just by accident. They happen to have an antivirus software that also checks for updates. By accident, user access control, which is turned on when you start up your computer for the first time, never got intentionally turned off. So just by sheer luck, they'll still have themselves a 15 or a 20. Um, I expect a lot of them to be packed in the 40 to 55, maybe 60 range. 
And then to get above the 60 range, they really do have to be on their toes. They have to be sharp. Um, I imagine, I mean, I'm, the, you guys here are probably in the 95 range because some of the stuff that's required is this. It's assuming that you're having certain services provided by an outside source and certain services on an inside source. Um, I would, I, to be honest, I wouldn't expect anybody but somebody like a credit union or a bank, except for BB&T, sorry. Um, a, I wouldn't, we had an employee who a lot of our cybersecurity groundwork was done who used to work for a credit union. And so he used to have to go through annual audits where the government would come in and audit them for security. And so a lot of the guidelines we have for our enhanced security policy framework were literally a list that he gave me of all the things that they would come in and check for. Um, so a credit union has to hold the standards that are insanely high. They would probably get a 95 to 100. Somebody like you guys hitting an 85 or 90, which I'm not, I don't doubt you guys do, is phenomenal. Any client of yours that does better than 80 is doing really, really well in the grand scheme of things. I really do expect most of them are going to fall in that 50 to 60 range. So don't, you know, don't make them freak out and don't get alarmed if they're hitting a 60 because in the grand scheme of things, a 60 is pretty good. Um, a 20 is like abhorrent. It's like they're not, they don't really care. But a 60 usually also indicates you have a good potential for a client who wants to be better. Because they're already at a 60, they're already doing, so that's the encouraging word to them. Don't say, oh, this is horrible, Helen. How could you be a 60? It's like, you know what, 60 isn't bad in the grand scheme of things, and it sounds like you really want to do better. But just filling out the questionnaire, when they get done, they've got 19 different ways, 18 different ways that they can improve their, their, their organization without even having to read anything more. It's on the checklist itself. They know that if their passwords are this complex, they know that the next level up is making them that. And that was kind of the intention of the, of the questionnaire, was not just to get a score, but to leave them with something that when they're done, they can go, wow, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. I should be doing that. Yes? Yeah, so one, um, it's late Friday, so maybe I missed it, but we already had a 20th question, unless I missed it. That's physical security. No, that's a good point. That's a good point, because you guys do a lot of, you work with paper files, right? No, 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 no. I mean, security of the network. I mean, is, is your network in a locked room? Okay, well, that's a good point. Do you keep your, your systems physically secured? Um, that's generally Sarbanes-Oxley types compliance that generally doesn't fit most smaller businesses. I mean, for example, and I think, I think in my brain why the reason it's separated is because when you do HIPAA compliance, there's three different areas, and one of them is physical security. And so there's, tech, there's technical security, there's physical security, and there's administrative security, and I, well, what policies and procedures. So I think out of habit, I just didn't even think about that. As be, be, I was really focusing in on like the, yeah. That's a perfectly legitimate question. And I think I sent you guys the, the, the digital, the editable format, so I mean it can easily be dropped on there um, and swapped out for one of the other questions. Yeah, I definitely want you, you to have the ability as a firm to take the questionnaire and, ev I mean, the way I've evolved the PowerPoint, I was given a, you know, something to work with four iterations later. It's still similar to what it started with two months ago, but a lot of it's changed. But the same thing with this. If the questionnaire gets changed around to suit your needs better or something that hones in more on where you see your biggest client weaknesses, I'm, I have no problem with that. I mean, as long as it's getting the word out and making people stop and think about their security. I mean, there was no question there about, did, did, you know, have you, do you look for skimmers when you're sticking your debit card? I will be now. Um, no, I never do. I just jam the card in there. Phil gets a zero. Um, I think that's it. The last page was just, uh... okay, so that was, it's a resummation of that last slide that I kind of breezed through uh, on, from the PowerPoint. That's pointing out, you know, what can, a, what can a managed services provider like PJ Networks or one of the other companies in town do? Because we can take a whole lot of that off of the shoulder. Just like you guys can not just do CPA work, but if you want, you have clients that you can do their bookkeeping work too, right? You can do all things all the way down to balancing their checkbook, I imagine, if they wanted you to. Um, and that takes, and, and if they would understand that, well, that takes the responsibility and puts it on you guys so they can focus on doing what they do. If you're an automotive mechanic, or if you're a lawn mow, if you're a lawn landscaper, you know, and you've got a team of landscapers, then why would you want to have one person who's stuck sitting at the computer doing your book work when they can pay you guys to do that, and they can go out and help run the business? And the same thing with this. With IT, you know, either somebody in-house is doing it, like Mike and Cam do for you guys, 
or nobody's doing it, or you hire somebody from the outside to do it. But it does, it does, it does, it's not even invasive. I mean, when we do managed services for our clients, pretty much the only time they hear from us is either A, we see a problem and we let them know, hey, Susie's computer's running really slow, or Susie's firewall keeps turning itself off and we keep turning it back on. 95% 90 of the time, there's nothing malicious going on there. It's just windows being flaky, and the firewall keeps turning on and turn it back on. Um, <clears throat> But it means that we're keeping an eye so that if something weird, because we did see a case of ransomware start to rip through a network about six or eight months ago. And as the, as the cl and client called us to tell us that their computer was acting weird, literally my computer just rebooted. And now that it's up, it's running really, really slow. And as they were saying that, the alerts were going off on our, um, on our computer screen and our monitoring console telling us that systems were getting... They were they were uh, pro they were protecting themselves, but there was it was the want it was a wanna cry type infection that was trying to push itself out sideways, and the, and the, the and the firewalls were alerting us that they were being attacked. So we were able to shut that down pretty quick. And it was, once that one machine was turned off, the alerts turned off. So yeah, there are warning signs that we can see that somebody sitting at the computer wouldn't necessarily know to look at. So, technical questions? Anything at all? Anything under the sun? Personal computers? Home computers? Business computers, network environments. Do you th anybody think you have clients that'll be interested in learning more about their own cybersecurity, or is it going to be hard to get their attention long enough to? And it's cut and dry stuff. Sometimes it's going to be boring. I think this Equifax thing is going to wake a few people up. Yeah, warning shot across the bow. Wanna cry was the same way too. It's almost getting to be overwhelming. It's it's kind of like you know watching the it's like the hurricanes. You know, so you have a hurricane come through every 20 years. That's like an earth-shaking thing. Everybody's like, oh, you know, maybe the weather's getting a little bit unstable. You have two of them come through in less than two weeks from each other. With another one coming up behind it, you start to go, hey, maybe I should start getting some disaster preparedness going on. And I think the same thing, I think the same thing is going on. People are running. I would have never thought that I was going to get, and I knew about, I knew about skimmers. Because Susan Wilkinson was talking about them at one of the presentations and had a handout from First Citizens with pictures of what skimmers look like. And I'm like, oh, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. But I didn't. Well, and once again, I'm assuming that I, I don't know for sure that that's what happened. It's just the only thing that people at the bank could imagine, how somebody could have called the automated teller system and gotten into my account and done anything. They would have had to have the card number and the, and the PIN number. Well, well, you know, and they could put some of that thing on the, on the machine at midnight and come back at six in the morning and take it off and a bank employee would never know it would never know that was there and somebody would have driven in there in, the, in those six hours absolutely agreed but you said they transferred money from your business account to your personal yeah see that's the uh, for our convenience for our convenience my wife and i had it so that my personal account, banking account has access to one to our main business checking account, so that as the owner, I can do owner draws and owner deposits and online. The danger of it is, if somebody gets access to my personal one, they then were able to. I, I, I'm still not. I don't. I don't still have the whole story straight. I still don't how, know how they would know what the the account numbers were for my business account if they got so my. They had to know the other. Yeah. They, they, so I'm still waiting on BB&T to give me a full explanation. They did seem awful happy, like, no, no, we're just giving you all your money back, and you know, we'll let you know if we find out anything. It's like, uh, <laughs> but I mean, they've been good to me for 12 years, so I'm going to give them a chance to. So you want the best news of all? It's Friday. It's the end of the day. The weather's beautiful. It's going to be a great weekend. Um, this is great stuff for uh, for clients to know. We, and Keith, it's his passion, network security and, and all that. I, 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 he's got it, his brain is like very, he's got it, he likes to tickle his thinker with this type of stuff. Um, I'm interested in it to a certain degree, but I have to deal with some, I mean, exchange servers and SQL servers and all that. That's why I've got experts. But I will say that, um, you know, when all is said and done, if your clients are more protected and you guys will feel better about it, if you guys are more knowledgeable when they ask you questions, they're going to feel more comfortable with you knowing that you're giving them good advice, not just financially, but technically. And anytime you have a question that any of your clients has, you can email, you've, my business card's there, Phil, you've got pens that have our domain name, Phil at PJ Hedges Networks, IT secure, or security, um, or call us, just call me. If you're sitting with a client customer of your own and they have a really important question, call just call us in at option one for business computer support. My cell phone will ring, and I'll answer it right there on the spot. That's what we do. 
um, because if it's that important that you needed to get the answer right then, it's important enough to me to answer it. And we won't charge anything for that. That's just a service that we give to, you know, to people that we like to work with. So. Well, and, and again, I mean, you know, our, our clients don't think of this risk often enough. I mean, they think, like I said, they're only going to attack big companies. I'm saying they're only, you know, they're only in big cities. They're uh, my system, but I mean, you know, people who put their lives, our clients put their lives in their businesses, and you know, they, they, their stuff is at risk, and so we we need to help them out. Yeah, well, my entire life savings are tied, I'm tied up in my business. You know, I mean, everything that I saved up in California went into PJ Networks, and then I've grown it. So, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah I mean, I, we're, that, I, feel, I feel better having a guy like, I mean, we were pretty secure already because we have some very talented and, and engineers with security things, and we had some good mechanisms, and I'm not, a, I'm not a slacker when it comes to it, but bringing Keith on board just gives me that level of security, knowing that, you know, whatever we were in security, it's like now it's, it's gone from there to there, so... All right, so please consider us a resource for more information and questions and, you know, and even, and like I said, even if it's a personal computer question, just send it to me and if you don't get an answer immediately, you know, when I'm sitting on the weekend catching up on email, I'll shoot you an answer. So. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank God it's Friday, everybody. Have a good weekend.